we are starting to approach a little bit of euphoria here. The tailwind that's coming from easy financial conditions is really not surprising. There's a begrudging acceptance in the investment community that this economy is really not nearly as fragile as people think. The economy because of AI and technology might keep on growing. That's the biggest actually potential market surprise. Maybe, just maybe, we could have stronger job growth with inflation coming down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, equity futures negative here by a third of 1%. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with a focus on one thing, China. China, China. A new growth target is 5%. The government acknowledging the difficulty of hitting it. They need to hit it. If you're Tesla or Apple. Two stocks to look at this morning in the pre-market. Let's begin with Apple. This from CounterPoint Research. iPhone sales in China falling by a surprising 24% Bramo over the first six weeks of this year. Two questions. One, how much is this weakness in China? And two, how much is this, this sort of nationalism around Huawei and going away from Apple phones? These are some of the big questions for both Apple and Tesla when you see the sales declines. How much is this something that is just sort of endemic of an economy that is slowing versus something Thing that really goes to geopolitical tension. Let's go through these numbers from Tesla together as well, Bramo. So Tesla had a really difficult session yesterday off the back of this. The numbers from the China Passenger Car Association. Shipments out of the Shanghai factory down 16% month on month. Lisa, year on year down 19%. Terrible figures. Which is the reason why you're seeing the shares down something like 2.2% pre-market trading, 2.4% now, and just so far year to date. Just to give you a sense, Tesla's down more than 50% from its peak in 2021. So yes, this is very much a China story. This is about demand. This is about demand for U.S. auto manufacturers. It's hard for them to hit that price point. They've been cutting prices in China. It's also, though, about the idea that the U.S. and China are moving further apart. You saw that with AMD. You saw that with this idea of regulatory issues that are going to get in the way of commerce. Tesla is down by 24% this year alone. So we've lost a quarter of our market cap in a little more than, say, two months, which is just absolutely dreadful. That name is down by another 2% this morning in the pre-market. Lisa asking the right question. Take your pick, AMH. Is this about growth in China or is this about rising nationalism? I think it's a little bit about both. But when you look at Apple, when it comes to Huawei, you saw when their new phone came out, a surge in people going out and buying them, even as Apple is cutting prices because of this patriotism. And this, to Lisa's point, is not going away. When you look at what AMD is trying to do, they created a chip that they thought the United States would give the green light. And the U.S., according to our reporting overnight, is saying not so fast. It's going to become much harder for companies to do business in China, regardless who wins the U.S. election November. The politics are complex. The economy is struggling. Look at this from the government. We need policy support and joint efforts from all fronts. Even they acknowledge, Bramo, that that 5% growth target they've put out is going to be difficult to hit. Because they don't want to increase the debt, which is the reason why people are kind of left with a lackluster feeling in markets. And oh yeah, guess what? They're also saying we welcome foreign investment in our manufacturing sector. Is that really going to be enough? Do you think anyone's going to say, okay, now I'm going to throw you a couple billion dollars because you said you want it? Here you go. There hasn't been anything concrete from any of this, and that's why you don't feel a lot of enthusiasm this morning. That's why you don't have a rally. We've got stocks down stateside on the S&P 500. We're negative here by a third of 1% on the S&P. Here's the state of play. Financial markets look a little something like this in the bond market a 10-year down two or three basis points for 18.57 bit of dollar strength out there negative by 0.06 percent on the euro 108 49. Coming up this hour this morning, great battle of BNP Paribas with cracks growing among the Magnificent Seven. Matthew Bartlett of Derby Field Advisors as voters head to the polls for Super Tuesday and Bloomberg's end the current as Chinese officials set lofty goals at the National People's Congress. We begin with our top story this hour. Cracks continuing to form between the Magnificent Seven. Nvidia still climbing as Tesla and Apple are facing headwinds in China. Great battle of BNP Paribas saying this. Tech is the part of the market with the best earnings forecast for Visions, but we are worried about valuations and think there are ways to potentially hedge or diversify to help mitigate some of that risk. Greg, I'm pleased to say it's with us around the table for the next 30 minutes. Greg, good morning. Good morning. Let's just get to the Magnificent Seven, the fragmentation, the cracks we're starting to see form in this big group of stocks. What do you make of that? What's the signal? Well, I think part of it is just that these are not homogenous stocks. So the real theme that's been the bullish catalyst for tech over the last uh, 12 months or so has obviously been this emergence of Gen AI. So the stocks that are most geared to that have done incredibly well. But what we see is the Magnificent Seven. They're not homogenous. There are stocks there with different outlooks, different exposures, China being a, a key feature among some of them. Let's get to that theme, China. Is that rising nationalism or is that an economic growth slowdown? What is it? 
I think the issue is it may be a couple of those things intertwined. I mean, you can look at the performance of domestic China equities over the last 12 to 18 months, and obviously that's been a very difficult market, so that points to something more domestically cyclical. But I think as we move forward this year towards the election, the idea of tariffs, trades, and deglobalization is going to be top of people's mind. How much pushback do you get? You're basically giving this bearish message, gloom and doom, you've got to be careful at a time where everybody else is going to the races. How much pushback do clients give you? I think clients are cognizant of this. We've had some very strong performance from equities. I think most of the positioning metrics we look at are incredibly stretched. Valuations are incredibly stretched. But the news flow domestically in the U.S. has been better. Growth data has been better. We've been in this kind of environment that you can de describe as benign, disinflationary Goldilocks. People expect the Fed to cut. So it's this fine balance between this exuberism, exuberance that's already priced in, high valuations, um, crowding, but potentially marginally better news flow. The reason why I ask this is because if you think about some of these idiosyncratic stories, and I hate to use the I word, but I just did, Apple and Tesla, yeah. and they're dealing with some real issues, whether it's the smartphone cycle that seems to be slowing down, electric vehicles sort of darlings are having some real issues. If you get some real downside risk to those stocks, how much could that be a catalyst to broader selling versus still sort of being in isolation? I think it depends what happens elsewhere. So if you have this, as you say, idiosyncratic group of stocks that suffer from weakness, but you still have uh, broad-based gains in the labor market, you have the AI story rumbling on in the background, I think there's enough positive catalysts to potentially keep the market going. But it certainly leaves the market more vulnerable. If you see the AI sl story just slowing a little bit, if you do see the data becoming either too hot or too cold, I think too hot is maybe the worry at the moment, then I think the fact that we have these cracks elsewhere is something that can leave the market more vulnerable. So do you categorize this as a bubble? It's always hard to characterize a bubble until it bursts, but I think we have some of those characteristics there. Valuations do look a little bit bubbly. Positioning looks a, a, a little bit bubbly. I think the thing which differentiates this to some prior bubbles is that the stocks that are leading the market here are very cash generative stocks. So although valuations are elevated, yeah, the story has been who can monetize AI and who can generate cash from it. So I'm not sure if we're necessarily in a bubble, but we're in a point where we're seeing exuberance and very stretched valuations. Lisa almost called you bearish and you've got a price target of 5150. I'm trying to make sense of that. 5150 is bearish in this market. 100%. I, I think that's a good characterization of where we are. You know, I've called it exuberant earlier, and I think the idea that you get very modest positive returns is seen as bearish. I think that's kind of mindful of the market uh, uh, mindset at the moment. So what are you seeing that other people aren't, that are upgrading their forecasts to 5,400, 5,500, that see the earnings revisions upwards, that talk about that better than expected economic growth? I think I'm just seeing that it's already priced. So we had this pivot from the Fed in November and December, we saw a massive rally from the market. We have had better data. So we have taken our target higher this year as well. But we think we're following what's already been priced by the market. I think to look for an equity market that gives you materially higher returns for the rest of this year than you can get from the risk-free rate in the bond market is something that's going to require a real re-acceleration in earnings further than what's already priced by the market. The issue with that is if you get that, then at the same time, you risk having some of these cuts that are still priced in from the Fed taken out of the market. So I think there's a little bit of a two-way pull that limits the right tail to the market. This is a really important week, most important week since last week until next week. But I'm curious about what, what you're looking for in terms of the non-farm payrolls to sort of get a gauge of the latest on the labor market. Also on the elections, we're going to get into that next block, but I'm curious from your vantage point, what you think is going to be the most important event? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of political noise this week, and the elections is obviously a big part of it. Um, but the thing about the elections is very difficult, maybe outside of trade in China, to position for that when there's a lot of water to come under the bridge in between now and November. Much more immediately, we have the payroll data and the CPI. And I think that's very important, because what's been driving the market this year has been solid growth, but also the narrative of benign disinflation. So what we expect to get from the payrolls um, is a sequential calling from the very hot print that we saw last month, but a still robust uh, payroll print. Um, in terms of CPI, the consensus is looking for a modest shift down, again, from the prior print. So those two things would be consistent with this benign disinflationary narrative that we're looking for. But I think the risks are asymmetric. If you were to have a print that is much too hot, then I think it creates risks for the market. And a print that's soft, we're then in line for soft landing? 
Yeah, I, I think that there's, at the moment, there's asymmetry that we're more worried about overheating than we are worried about things being too cool. But you do have that symmetric, uh, or the, it's, it's not necessarily a symmetric risk, but you do have the two tails of the risk. That if you see the growth decelerate too rapidly, then people start to worry a little bit about growth again. But at the moment, it feels like we're in that kind of sweet spot of uh, benign disinflation and Goldilocks. But I think the risks in the very short term are if the data comes in too hot. Nouria Rabini, Volume 2. It's kind of what Nouria said to us yesterday. The biggest risk up front right now is upside risk, and ultimately that's bad news for this stock market, right? Well, essentially, if you get rates that stay higher for longer, then all of a sudden you get some sort of froth that's beaten out of the market. We've heard that from a number of people. What I struggle with here is we've seen a lot of companies be pretty rate insensitive. So at what point does the rate sensitivity kick in if we haven't seen it so far? And that, John, to me, is really one of the key questions is we really haven't seen it. I found some yesterday somewhat impressive was the fact that we were only down by 0.1 percent even though apple was lower by 2.5 and tesla was down by close to seven percent weren't you impressed by that we could sit here and say it's signs of exuberance this weakness under the surface but at the end of the day the fact that we're still near all-time highs and we've got apple down from the highs of the year by about double digits now the likes of google haven't done well either tesla's been a quarter of its market cap is gone, and the fact is we're still near all-time highs. Yeah. When you look at what the driver of that is, though, it's not because there's been broad-based support from the market. It's because there's been four or five stocks that have had absolutely exceptional returns. So I think it's a little bit less healthy than it looks. Is that justified, though? This is what David Costin's getting into over at Goldman. Yes, OK, we can all sit here and say it's down to a handful of names. But are the valuations of those handful of names justified? Is it justified by the fundamentals? So I think that... The marginal moves that we see may be justified for the fundamentals. What I mean by that is the news flow we've seen from those stocks has been better this year. But the issue is some of the starting valuations are very elevated. So that what leaves us more vulnerable. And I think one of the things that we would question is whether the right way to play this very narrow rally is by the broad indices. Because if this is being driven by a handful of stocks and you have to have very high conviction about what that earnings path is out over the next decade or so, is the right thing to do to buy broad-based indices to reflect that? I think maybe not. Greg Battle of BNP Paribas. Greg, you're going to stick with us. Equity futures right now, negative by a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Bloomberg has learned that advanced micro devices has hit a U.S. government roadblock in attempting to sell an AI chip tailored for the Chinese market. Sources say AMD had hoped for a green light from the Commerce Department to sell the AI processor to Chinese customers, but U.S. officials told AMD the chip was still too powerful and the company must obtain for their licenses. Elon Musk has lost his position at the top of the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Tesla shares tumbled 7.2% yesterday. Now Jeff Bezos, the Amazon founder, is at the top with a net worth of more than $200 billion. Musk's fortune is $198 billion. The wealth gap between the pair was once as wide as $142 billion but has now been shrinking with Amazon more than doubling since 2022. Tesla, for its part, is down 50% from its 21 peak. The International Space Station has four new residents after the successful docking of SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. The three NASA astronauts and one Russian cosmonaut will oversee the arrival of two new rocket ships during their six-month stay. Boeing's new Starliner capsule with test pilots is due to arrive in late April, while Sierra Space's Dream Chaser mini shuttle is due a month or two later. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. Up next on this program, Super Tuesday has arrived. The poll numbers are very good. We're uh, beating President Biden in almost every poll. It is time for a new generational leader who can leave the negativity and the baggage behind and get to work for the American people. Conversation coming up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. It's a huge week in politics. Today, it's Super Tuesday, and former President Trump is looking to cement his place as the Republican nominee. Then, Thursday, as the border, the economy, and the November elections dominate the headlines, President Biden will deliver his State of the Union address. Balance of Power's Joe Matthew, Kaylee Lines, and Bloomberg's top political analysts will bring you live global coverage of both events, starting at 9 p.m. Eastern. Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
Stocks on the S&P 500 negative here on the S&P. We're pulling back by around about a third of 1%. Yields are a little bit lower, down three. Your yield on a 10-year, 418.18. Under Savannah's this morning, Super Tuesday has arrived. The poll numbers are very good. We're uh, beating President Biden in almost every poll, whether it was the leading candidate or a candidate that was well down on the totem pole. You cannot take somebody out of a race. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly. We can do better than two 80-year-old candidates for president. It is time for a new generational leader who can leave the negativity and the baggage behind and get to work for the American people. Here's the latest this morning. The biggest day of the primary season set to begin with voters in 15 states heading to the polls in a pivotal point for the GOP nomination. Former President Donald Trump holding a wide lead over his last remaining challenger, Nikki Haley. A strong performance today may all but secure a Trump and Biden rematch. Joining us to discuss is Matthew Bartlett of Derby Field Advisors. Matt, my first question, and I know that this is difficult, but please define what success looks like tomorrow morning for Nikki Haley. Uh, it is unclear what success will look like tomorrow morning. It will not be a good morning for Nikki Haley, um, but she might wait till November. Um, and if Donald Trump loses, that could be success. So success could be, you know, a future effort, um, an I told you so effort by Nikki Haley. But right now, it is very unclear. It is Super Tuesday, um, but this really is, like you just said, um, you know, a, a much more of a, a stress test for the general election between former President Trump and current um, President uh, Biden. Um, so this is, you know, heading in that direction. I think this nomination will be wrapped up in about two weeks. Nikki Haley, again, she's looking to get uh, the prize without the winning, um, and that might be uh, sometime in the future. Does she end up endorsing the former president when he, at some point later this month, actually clinches the nomination? Uh, that's such a good question. It seems as if she does not have what it takes to get the GOP nomination. Uh, but it's quite possible that her voters are the ones that can unlock a general election win for either Trump or possibly Joe Biden. The notion that she just stated this week that she may not ultimately endorse Trump um, really leaves up to question, where do her voters go? And does Trump make an appeal for that? Does Biden make an appeal for them? That's actually what I'm looking for today. What are the margins? Um, can Nikki sneak one past the goalie and maybe Virginia and maybe Vermont? Um, and then what does her exit look like? And conversely, what does Trump's speech look like tonight? Does he try to graciously welcome her and her supporters? Or does he go much more of the vicious, uh, vitriolic, uh, maybe even vile um, speech um, like, like after New Hampshire? She's raised $1 million so far just in the first few days of March. She also raised still $12 million in February. It was down from the nearly $17 million in January. But she's still bringing in money. Does she just stay in this race to build a war chest for her future? Um, listen, Amory, that's a good point. She outraised Donald Trump. Donald Trump right now has a cash crunch, maybe both personally um, and certainly politically. Um, that is absolutely worth noting. Listen, Nikki has a set of supporters and also a set of donors. They like her. They like her message. They like what she's doing. Everyone knows that this is not headed towards the nomination in 2024 and maybe even in 2028. But nonetheless, they want her to soldier on, carry on, um, because they like the spirit of what she is doing. So it remains unclear how this ends, because it really is something of an illogical campaign right now. It is not a presidential campaign. It is much more of a messaging campaign. And right now, that message is important for her and her supporters. Matt, when we're talking about basically getting to the general election, with about a third of all Republican voters today uh, going to the primaries to vote, how much are we looking at actual potential policies from each presidential candidate, from both President Biden, but also from Trump about what they plan to do with tariffs, for real, what they plan to do with immigration, for real, what their projection is for debt and tax cuts, all of these things that markets really care about. Yeah, I mean, Brahma, that's like the, the key issue here. What does the future look like for President Biden, for President Trump, for the American people? What are the issues? Right now, it seems to be campaigns um, that are absent um, a lot of ideas, 
a lot of motivation right now. It tends to be very personal, whether it's Donald Trump looking for revenge or whether it's Joe Biden saying, I'm the only one that can beat Donald Trump again. Um, so that is not a very compelling message. Um, with the economy being the top issue on voters' minds, you know, you would think both Trump, both Biden would be on surveillance, making their case to the street, to the American public on the most critical pressing issues um, at hand. Hopefully, we'll get much more substance um, as things develop. You know what it's like, Matthew. No problem. President, former or sitting, wants actual questions on American TV. But that's a conversation for another time. Matt, can you talk to me about policy on Thursday night when we hear from the president and we get the State of the Union address? What are the policy initiatives that he's going to lean on a little bit more aggressively? Yeah, this is going to be um, the biggest speech President Biden has ever given in his life. This is going to set the tone, not just politically in Congress, um, but more importantly for the campaign trail. He needs to make sure that he can bring together the coalition that he had in 2020, make sure that left flank, um, which has been somewhat agitated in recent months, maybe for, or in, over foreign policy issues, uh, stays with him. He needs to reach out to middle America, to voters that may feel disenfranchised over inflation or economic ang angst. Um, so he really needs to make a compelling ish, uh, argument as well as his performance. In a town that does not make anything, that hardly does anything, how you present has an outsized influence, um, whether you like it or not. So true. And we appreciate the pitch for the interview as well. Matthew, thank you, sir. Matthew Bartlett <laughs> of Derby Field Advisors. Bramo, I know this is why you're frustrated. But on Thursday night is the opportunity to talk about policy. What kind of policy initiatives is the president going to discuss? Honestly, what people are talking about right now is how long is he going to speak for? Will he present vigor? I mean, honestly, this is kind Can of Can he the get problem. through 60 minutes? Can he get through 60 minutes? But this is what people are talking about. What I want to know about is, seriously, what are some of the economic projections? We talked about the Trump trade last time around. It was basically the market goes up. You've talked about this a lot, John. Mm -hmm. Can we repeat that? With a President Biden, what kind of uh, goals are there with respect to the ongoing fiscal spending that's been supporting this economy? There are a lot of really key questions that affect this economy, and we're not talking about any of them. And the sequencing of Trump volume one, Greg Battle, it's your turn, I'm afraid, was to go tax cuts, then tariffs. Tax cuts, market off to the races. This time around, it feels like it might go tariffs and then tariffs. How do you set things up for clients when you start to discuss these issues? So there's a couple of things. I think it's very difficult that we have a lot of noise this week, but much of this won't manifest until the back end of the year when we get a better idea of who might win, whether it's divided or united government, because that makes a big difference for things like fiscal policy. Um, and I think that the reaction function now versus 2016 is going to be very different. You know, post-Trump's uh, victory in 2016, what we saw were reflationary policies that were universally well received by the market. Even if we were to have a reflationary tailwind, is that as helpful for markets now when actually I've just cited earlier rates as potentially the biggest risk for equity markets? I think the thing that we're most focused on is tariffs, trade, deglobalization. You already had a lot of China-related news flow at the top of the program. Um, not related to the elections, but due to some of the issues that we're already seeing there from the likes uh, of some of those more China-exposed Magnificent Seven. So I think tariffs, deglobalization, and trade will be the key feature for the election and for a lot of the rhetoric that we get running into November. But Greg, whether or not it's Biden or Trump, there's going to be tariffs when it comes to China. But with Trump, it looks like it's going to be more aggressive. He's talking about, whether he does it or not, a 60% blanket tariffs potentially on imports. How do you even think of preparing for that? So I think that the way that we've been talking about it is looking at the U.S. names that we think are most exposed to this. So it's difficult because you have these crosswinds in China locally, where the China equity market has struggled, as I said earlier, for 12 to 18 months. And it's potentially, uh, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily call a bullish inflection point here, but people are looking at it more, more closely. Um, but the U.S. names exposed to China have performed better. So that's something that we put in our outlook for 2024, that you can take U.S. names exposed to China, short that basket, but potentially put that as either a short China trade by putting U.S. domestic cyclicals against it, or you could actually put it as a bullish China trade by putting something locally in China against it as well. Interesting. Greg, good to see you. Thank Always you. is. Thank you, sir. Greg Battle, FBNP Paribas, 51.50 year-end the price target. Bramo's calling that bearish. We closed yesterday at 51.30. <laughs> Coming up next on this program, Bloomberg's end the current as China sets ambitious goals for growth. Can they hit them? We'll discuss next from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
stocks pulling back here on the S&P. We're down by a third of 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, we're negative by 0.6, snapping a two-day winning streak in yesterday's session. Marginal losses down by 0.1%, even with the likes of Tesla down 7%. Apple struggling as well. NVIDIA up by 3.5%. This is going to be a theme for us today, Lisa. Just the breakup of the Magnificent 7. We were talking about the Magnificent 1, the Magnificent 4. It seems like Tesla already has dropped out. A lot of people have already kind of relegated that to the back, to the back of the room. But now Apple facing some real questions about China and the smartphone demand that doesn't dog the likes of NVIDIA. Let's turn to the bond market, push away from stocks just for a moment. We're down two basis points on a two-year, 457.67. And before yesterday, four consecutive days of falling two-year yields. Yields higher across the curve in yesterday's session, but this morning again, once again, we're lower. We're down by two basis points on a two-year. Lisa down three basis points on a 10-year. ISM services a little bit later on today, just ahead of all that jobs data later in the week. Yeah, 10 a.m. And we saw some weakness in services data that came last week, Do we, or last month rather. Do we see that continue? This is really going to be one of the keys for people who are looking for inflation. I will just say... One of the big questions underpinning all of our discussions is, at what point do bond markets matter for stocks? And do they, right? I mean, is this stock market sustainable even if rates go materially higher? It sort of depends on the day. It depends on the reason. It depends on the person you talk to. But fundamentally, that's really one of the key questions of 2024. I'm not going to make a call. I won't offer an opinion, just an observation. We went from 4.1% January to 4.7% in the last week. Stock's still close to all-time highs. That's quite remarkable. But that's, I think, the point, which is at what point does the uh, Torsten Slock view of the world kind of take hold? Or maybe the Fed doesn't cut rates this year. Maybe you get rates that are higher. And guess what? Stocks could still gain. That, I think, is one of the potential outcomes people are looking at. I think Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan scratching his head about the same issue as well. <laughs> we'll get to Marco's call later in the morning. Equity futures then, slightly negative this morning. Just want to finish on the euro, 108.52 totally unchanged going into the ECB later this week. That meeting taking place on Thursday. Under surveillance this morning, NYCB levelling off after facing another plunge and a series of downgrades. Shares of the company falling to the lowest level since 1996, falling 26 and 23 percent over the last two trading days. Fitch ratings cutting its assessment and Moody's lowering it even further into junk territory. The stock losing more than two thirds of its value so far this year. Ramo, here's the good news if there is any, and I think this plays into the theme in the broader market. The ability of markets at the moment to compartmentalise issues, to say what's happening here doesn't have to influence what's happening there. JP Morgan again yesterday, closing at an all-time high. If you go back to the difficulties of last spring in March, the likes of JP Morgan was down 9%. I think for the financial system, there's a willingness, I would say almost encouraged by what happened last year, just to say it's an issue for them. It's not an issue for the others. And it's a management issue as much as it is uh, markets or a sort of broader economic issue. I think that is a huge signal, though, considering just how much of a sell-off and such a macro concern the banking issues were last spring. This does tell you that people are really looking past this. And we have Jay Powell that's going to be on the Hill tomorrow, and he is going to be asked about this. Be this whole idea, Jonathan, you're talking about compartmentalization. Is that true when you have about 80 percent of these regional banks holding the commercial real estate loans? He's going to be grilled on whether or not he thinks this is idiosyncratic or not. NYCB right now in the free market up by three and a half percent. We've been going through the difficulties of Apple and Tesla. If you're just joining us, these are the headwinds they're facing in China as we discuss more and more about the breakup in a bit, Max 7. iPhone sales falling 24 percent over the first six weeks of this year. This according to Counterpoint Research. Tesla continuing its fall after posting a 16 percent drop month over month in shipments from China, according to data from the Passenger Car Association. We're talking about a name Bramo that's lost a quarter of its value year to date. Tesla down 24%. Apple, no longer the darling of this equity market in any way, shape or form. We're down 9% year to date. And how much is this? And really, I think that it's really good that you started the show this way, which is why is this happening? Is it because of China or is it because of just a general slowdown in growth? Is it because of the uh, geopolitics of the matter? And the issue is we've seen the smartphone cycle kind of lag. We've seen the electric vehicle darlings really struggle with this question around adoption and how quickly they can be brought online. And then you add into that the sense of China doesn't want U.S. things being sold there. The U.S. doesn't want U.S. companies to yeah. sell certain technology to China. That really adding to the fact that China isn't growing. You put these things together, hard to get too excited about potential growth in the near term. I think we're allowed to say all of the above. All three issues. One, growth in China. Two, the prospect of rising nationalism. And three, 
real sector specific issues, smartphone industry, EVs, etc. We've seen so much bad news around the EV business over the last few weeks or so. On the number one issue, growth in China, they've got some lofty ambitions, let's put it that way. 5% growth target coming from the National People's Congress. The ambitious goal, that ambitious goal matching that of last year, but the economy is now facing deflation alongside a deepening property slump. Defence spending also set to gain 7%, so that's the most in five years. Enda Curran's joining us now to break some of this down. Bloomberg's very own out of Washington, D.C. Enda, can we get into the goal itself? How difficult will it be to hit 5% this year? It's obviously going to be hard. Premier Lee said that himself in the speech, John, last night. He said it's going to be tough. It's going to require support on all fronts. They're talking about around 5%. That's hard because of the base effect compared to last year, of course. It's hard because China is stuck in its worst streak of deflation since the late 1990s, since around the Asia financial crisis. And it's hard because we know they have not turned the corner on the housing crisis. A sentiment there remains in the doldrums. Now, it does suggest that the government is going to have to borrow and spend more. There was some commentary in the report about uh, special gov central government bonds of around 100, 139 billion. Some economists are seizing on that and suggesting that the, that means the authorities will be willing to put their money where their mouth is. But the overall tone of the report is still kind of along the lines of, of fiscal discipline. So it's an ambitious target. It's going to be a hard target to hit. But if China does pull that off, and if this is a year of the turnaround for the economy there, then that, of course, would be an important uh, growth driver for the global economy. Remember, it's been all about U.S. outperformance with China in doldrums. This would reverse at least some of that. And uh, how? How can they achieve this without adding to the debt? I mean, saying to people, look, we welcome foreign investments in our industrial sector doesn't really work when you have people who have been burned time and again internationally. What's going to actually drive some growth if it's not going to be leverage fueled? Yeah, and markets themselves don't seem to be especially convinced by this, judging by the, by the reaction, Lisa. And, 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 of course, by the way, the subplot in terms of the cancelled press conference by Premier Lee, uh, you know, that doesn't speak to transparency and confidence in China's economy either. But it's still a pretty high, ambitious growth target. And when the government sets it, typically they will ensure that it is met. And that's why I mentioned this point about the special central government bonds that they're talking about, $139 billion, worth keeping an eye on that. The fiscal deficit was set at 3% for this year. But, of course, they may have some flexibility. They could adjust that as the year goes on. So there are some suggestions that they will be willing to borrow and try and hit this. Now, interestingly, the statement for the first time in several years did not say that houses are for living in. They are not for speculating. That might suggest they're planning to take some pressure off the real estate, off the property developer side of things. And, of course, if they can get a turnaround on housing, then you will see a broader lift in the, in the rest of the economy, too. And now that she mantra has been in the report since 2019. So it does seem like this is a big shift. What can they do? do in terms of shoring up the property sector? Well, they've been taking these kind of piecemeal decisions throughout all of last year to try and make it easier for, say, property developers to get financing, easier for them to develop their projects. They've brought down the cost of borrowing, the cost of mortgages for those who are buying these, these apartments off these developers. So they've been taking these piecemeal steps, but none of it so far has turned it around. And that's why some people are saying perhaps now by dropping this line about the property market isn't for speculation, maybe they're going to take even more steps this year. And, and you know, that goes to the kernel of China's slowdown. It's all about the real estate slump. It makes up maybe 20, 25 odd percent of the economy. You can imagine the multiplier effect that goes with that. If they can turn that around, uh, that then will have consequences for commodity markets and that then will lift a broader China story and I think will have spillover effects globally too. They're, they're also going to be increasing their defence target, 7.2% in 2024, most in five years. What should we take when it comes to this figure? Yes, it's an increase, but we do know that China has been fighting a ton of corruption within their military spending. Yeah, look, I think it speaks to, they have been increasing it steadily over the years. I think it just speaks to the whole geopolitical security story right now. Defence spending is back on the agenda everywhere, Anne-Marie. As you know, China is no different. They have been developing and beefing up uh, investment in their defence forces for several years. And I would imagine they're looking ahead to the US election later this year, where potentially, uh, you know, at the very least, the current administration has maintained a hawkish stance towards China. If it changes go government towards the end of the year, that could double down in a hawkish stance towards China. They're watching what's going on in other parts of the world, the Middle East and Ukraine. I think it just fits the whole narrative of uh, defence spending and geopolitics globally. And before we run, if that's going to be the case, 
if we get a more hawkish approach to China, I want to talk about the blowback to US companies. Are we seeing signs of nationalism start to hit Apple in a more profound way, start to hit Tesla in a bigger way? Is that just a subtle shift that we're starting to witness that becomes a bigger shift over the next 12 months? I mean, it could be. I mean, don't forget, John, on the one hand, the Chinese government keep preaching that they're open for business, they want foreign investment, and they do want foreign investment after FDI turned a negative for last year, after portfolio flows f fled the country. They absolutely do, but of course, to your point, on the ground, we see actions speaking louder than words. For example, those raids on various US companies last year hasn't done anything to, to inspire confidence. So I, I would say it's still a pretty fragile sentiment for U.S. companies operating in China this side of the election and, and after. And a thank you, sir. And a Karen there of Bloomberg down in Washington, D.C. Speaking of inspiring confidence, check out Target in a pre-market. Up by more than 6%. These numbers inspire confidence. EPS 298, the estimate Bramo 240, saying all the right things about the fourth quarter. I think inventory coming down much bigger, in a much bigger way than expected as well. Yeah, and when they talk about the full year forecast for earnings per share this year, 860 to 960 versus the estimate of 912, when you dig beneath the surface, though, what I find interesting is they confirmed Bloomberg's previous reporting that it plans to go up against Walmart Plus and some of these membership programs that have online benefits. It also talked about upgrading its fleet of stores and guess what? Creating more shops like Ulta Beauty. Everyone is sort of banking on the fact that 13-year-old girls have 15 facials that they do every single night. I'm just saying, that seems to be That's what the Target's trend. leaning into. 100%. That's why the stock is up by 6% of the pre-market. <laughs> we saw the same thing with Macy's. <laughs> They're all going to try to cash in on the Sephora gold mine that seems to be happening right now. Better numbers and inventory's lower. I won't lean into that. The stock is higher <laughs> in the pre-market by a little more than 6%. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. It's the biggest day on the presidential primary calendar. 15 states and one territory vote head to the polls for Super Tuesday. Former President Donald Trump is expected to win a majority of the Republican delegates. He picked up 29 more last night in North Dakota, sweeping the caucuses with 84 percent of the vote versus Nikki Haley's 14. Activist investor Nelson Peltz wants to, quote, restore the magic at Disney. His try and fund management published a 133-page white paper ahead of the AGM. It suggests a partner for Disney's traditional TV channels, a review of studio operations, and a succession plan for CEO Bob Iger. A group formed by Tran holds about $3.5 billion in Disney stock, and they're seeking an overhaul of the board. Bitcoin's price is nearing an all-time high, driven by continued demand for those new U.S. bought Bitcoin ETFs and a looming halving. The ETF has attracted almost $8 billion of net inflows since debuting in January. Bitcoin's market cap touched $1.35 trillion, beating its peak in 2021. That's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Hey, Danny, thank you. Staggering numbers. Just a program note for you. Samara Cohen, CIO over at BlackRock, joining us a little bit later. In about 20 minutes from now, we'll discuss some of those numbers with BlackRock. Equity futures right now slightly negative on the S&P. Up next on the program, U.S. growth as the next market risk. We would talk about a soft landing, but actually there is serious possibility of what people refer to as a no landing, that growth remains above uh, potential and inflation remains sticky. And apparently that might be a problem for equity markets. That conversation is up next. Stocks pulling back on the S&P 500. We're down here by a third of 1%. Yields are lower by, let's call it three basis points, 4.1837. Just pulling back ahead of a big week of central bank speaking in Colombia data. Under surveillance this morning, the biggest risk, strong US growth. We would talk about a soft landing, but actually there is serious possibility of what people refer to as a no landing, that growth remains above uh, potential. And inflation remains sticky. Paradoxically, that good news on growth may be bad news for the market if that implies the Fed is not going to cut as much and as soon as people expect now. So good news would be bad news. Here's the latest. Investors preparing for two rounds of Chairman Powell testimony on Capitol Hill and U.S. payrolls to round out the week. Joe Lavornia of SNBC Nico Securities expecting the job market to cool off saying this. Temp hiring has been falling almost uninterruptedly since March 2022, suggesting that the recent uptrend in private payrolls will eventually reverse. I'm pleased to say that Joe joins us now to look at that labour market. Joe, let's go straight to it. Friday then, would you expect weakness or is that too early? 
It's too early, uh, Jonathan. In part, you know, there's a lot of distortion with these data in terms of how the government does its adjustments. And the early part of the year is very difficult where you have a huge seasonal uh, ad need in January. And typically that distortion can spill over into February. Last year, for example, we had a big January job gain and another really strong report in February. History could repeat again. And this year we had another very strong January job report. And uh, potentially we're gonna see over 200,000 jobs again on Friday. The temp hiring I like because that tells us where future demand is and it's definitely slowing. Ultimately, you believe that the reinflation risk remains low still, even with these yes. recent numbers, even with the easing of financial conditions. Is that all about the labour market, in your view, going forward from here, or is it other things as well? No, there's other things as well. I mean, people talk about financial conditions easing, and they have eased for investors. Credit spreads have tightened, uh, the equity market has zoomed higher. But if you look at U.S. households, Jonathan, they're paying record high mortgage rates still, uh, credit card rates, auto rates, personal loans. Commercial banks are tightening lending standards. The yield curve is still inverted. That suggests financial conditions are still tight. On the inflation stickiness story, I don't understand that argument at all. Uh, we're importing deflation from China. Commodity prices are down sharply. We know that rents are going to moderate significantly, according to the BLS's own data. Uh, core and headline PC year-on-year -year numbers, which is what you want to look at because of this possible residual seasonality at the beginning of the year, those are still coming down quite sharply. So I don't understand the sticky inflation argument. If there's a concern about equities, it's just that they have gone much further ahead of where fundamentals suggest. And if there is still a recession at some point, the market hasn't priced it. Joe, do you think then that the Federal Reserve should be cutting rates more aggressively at this point? Yes, I've been arguing for some time, Lisa, that the Fed was going to break something. They did last uh, March with the um, regional bank crisis. They've taken rates up too far too fast. We know inflation peaked in June of 22, just when the Fed began its first uh, of, of 375 basis point rate cuts. Core inflation peaked in September 22. Uh, given the lags, yes, I think the Fed has gone too much uh, too far. One of the reasons there has been recession is companies have been able to lock in those low rates. And according to my calculations, we've spent over $3 trillion of excess federal spending relative to baseline in the last three years. So that's helped. But it doesn't mean there isn't weakness below the surface. Often rate cuts are portrayed as something of a political decision. And currently this week, we will be talking a lot about that with Jay Powell on the Hill, talking to the House and then the Senate. Some people saying that if the Fed were to cut rates aggressively ahead of the election, that that would help Biden get reelected. How do you view this through a political lens? Do you think that that is relevant in this sort of calculations here at a time where nobody wants to be accused of political bias at the Fed? I, I do believe it's a factor. I mean, we have not begun a rate hiking cycle in a presidential campaign, at least since 1984. You can't really figure out what the Fed did prior to that because they didn't communicate as transparently as they do now. So there definitely is a political, I think, a, a part of this. And that, that's one of the reasons why Jay Powell sort of, I think, laid the groundwork for cuts way back in December and why he went on 60 Minutes and saying, look, the inflation numbers have been good. If we keep rates uh, where they are, real rates will expand. We want to kind of get ahead of that. So I I mean, it was political, I think, in the proper way of preparing the markets for what I do think will be easing. But as you know, if they cut, there's going to be complaints. And if they don't cut, there's going to be complaints. Joe, do you think there's a cutoff in the timeline, like the last possible moment they could before the election, so they can at least look like they're not being political, even though they say they're not even thinking about being political? Right, right. Yeah. June would be my guess. I mean, do you really, if you think you might be cutting in July, and you can make a case that inflation's coming down and you need to adjust rates, even modestly. Why not make that move in June and then sit tight in July, which is going to be sandwiched right in between the RNC and DNC convention? So I think if they don't go by June, it's going to be a lot harder for them to start cutting. It's funny because Rafael Bostic, Bramo, said something similar about how we could start cutting, then stop. Ultimately, don't expect back to back. We don't have to do it that way. We can cut interest rates, then look around and see how it plays out. Well, this is something that people are speculating increasingly, that basically just because they cut once doesn't mean that they're actually going to be on a cutting cycle. That, however, is not being priced into markets in any way, shape or form, because it seems like basically the kickoff date for an aggressive cutting se uh, section. And that, to me, is really one of the key questions. Also, what is the terminal rate? We still haven't established that. Joe, is that possible? Do you think they could cut interest rates, then just stop and not signal what comes next? Uh, they could. I mean, it'd be unusual. Typically, you know, you've had, I, I calculated four soft landings when the Fed cuts on average about 75 basis points. So it's possible. I mean, this cycle has been so unique. 
they could cut once or twice and then wait and then cut again next year or cut more. So it's possible. I mean, I don't think it's likely because I do believe monetary policy is tight and there's reasons why the lags are a lot longer. I'm very troubled, Jonathan, by that inverted yield curve. And I do believe that is sucking capital out of the banking system. And there's a lot of, you know, credit crunch type and things that are happening below the surface. We're seeing more anecdotal evidence that the private credit markets are under duress. So I think they'll have to go more than 75, may even go 100 this year. But uh, can they go and stop and start again? Sure. And I, by the way, I don't know what's bad about that. I don't know why the Fed always has to say it knows what it's going to do all the time True. and be so transparent. I don't remember the last time the curve wasn't inverted. We're trying to find the date. I dig that yeah, out. Well, if you look at monthly, if you look at monthly averages, you have to go back to it inverted in July of 22 using monthly averages, right when inflation peaked and right when the Fed went their first 75. Interesting. Joe, I just want to finish on the politics, the policy. I'm not going to ask you if you'd serve in the Trump administration out of respect for your current firm. I do want some details from you, though, on how you see the trade story playing out if the former president came back into the White House. Can you walk us through your experience in Trump's National Economic Council, what the thinking was at the time, and whether you think the thinking has changed, whether you think they're going to be more aggressive this time around? I, I, don't, think, um, I don't think anything has changed. I think you know, the president, you know, former president, has been very clear that he wants to use tariffs. But I think you have to think of the policy, Jonathan. He's, the former president is very transactional. He wants to do deals and he wants to get things done. And the tariffs are just a means to have a conversation. As you know, sometimes he might start from you know the extreme side of things and eventually come back to the middle. But I don't think the trade policy will, will change that much. I do think you'll try to see more onshoring. You will try to see more energy uh, production uh, to basically try to bring some of these supply chains back. And I do think tariffs will be the negotiating point. So I think what you got in Trump 1, you'll get in Trump 2.0 again. What is the ask then? If that's the negotiation tactic, what is the ultimate ask of China, of Europe? Yeah, I think, well, I, I think on the European side, certainly to contribute more uh, on the NATO side. I know Germany has talked about it. They haven't allocated the funds, but certainly, certainly on the defense side, that's part of it. And I think in terms of China, part of it also will be, you know, uh, it's not tr the trade deficits are large. Some of that Chinese uh, goods are coming in through Mexico, but kind of maybe leveling the playing field and trying to make it a little bit more fair trade. I mean, I think the president, I don't think he has anything against free trade. It's just that he believes that sometimes we're at a competitive disadvantage because China doesn't have to hear the same kind of rulemaking and regulatory backdrop that, that we have. So I think there's going to want to be some changes to try to make it more even. The trade deficit improves. That's great. But I think he just wants a more robust economy. And the manufacturing sector, while it's a small piece of the economy, is highly cyclical. It has been weak. And I think he'd like to see that to be re, you know, rejuvenated, if you will. Interesting. Appreciate the input. Joe, it's good to catch up. It's been too long. Thank Joe Lavorna there. Thank you, sir, of SNBC, Nico Securities, and potentially the future National Economic Council director as well. Bramo, what did you make of that at the end there? There is a dissonance between the likes of Gary Cohn and Joe Lavornia and the way that they couch the former president's policies and what they might look like this time around. And the rhetoric that we hear out of, the pres out, of, out of Trump and what people say, which is if you take him at his word... This is what the policy is. And in the past, he has gone through with his words. So there's a bit of a dissonance there. The one thing I did take away from Joe, though, is that when you hear Trump talk about maybe it's going to be more than 60 percent tariffs on China, I do want to potentially build a 10 percent tariff wall. Sure, maybe that's the direction of travel. But it sounds like from Joe that that could be tempered. So it wouldn't be as extreme as potentially the foreign president is talking about in public if he's just trying to do a carrot and stick approach of trying to get a deal. Does this tip for tap work both ways? For instance, do you think the United States is going to drop its tariffs on imported trucks? Do you think that's going to happen? No. So it's not going to work both ways? Correct. So the big tariffs the US has on importing stuff, that stays. But ultimately, if you have big tariffs on the United States, we're going to put ours up. You know, and, and is that how this point? works? Well, it doesn't work, essentially, because and basically you're seeing that on both sides. So regardless of whether it's Trump or Biden, what Joe was saying there about what Trump wants to do is sort of similar to what Biden wants to do. He just is doing it somewhat differently. So, you know, honestly, at a certain point, how do you game that out to try to come up with some sort of projection for 2025? Honestly, I'm being snarky. What I think is the, the bigger issue, I mean, shock horror, what I think is the bigger issue is just how much national security has crossed over into the realm of international trade and it's the national security lever they're going to pull on a whole lot more up next in the next hour samara cohen of blackrock bloomberg's josh wingrove pierre fedigo of new street and constant hunter of macro policy perspectives a lot to get through live from new york city this is bloomberg
possibility of what people refer to as a no landing. The risk of a no landing scenario, i.e. inflation staying high and growth staying high, that's really the tricky part for the Fed. Right now, the, the, the risk is that they could make a mistake and they could cut too soon. Inflation could remain far stickier for longer. How can the Fed cut when inflation expectations are continuing too much higher? It really is a major tra challenge for the Fed here. I tend to agree with where the consensus is starting to go to. I, I think the Fed's going to have a hard time cutting rates the amount of times they want to. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Perro, Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. The second hour of Bloomberg Surveillance begins right now, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg, and the MAG7 continues to break down. Just check out the performance year to date. Here we are. There is absolutely nothing synchronized about this in any way, shape, or form. Apple, on the year, down 9%. Tesla, down 24 Google, negative 4 On the year, Microsoft, positive 10%. Amazon, up 17 Meta, up 41 Nvidia up by 72%. It's a question of who has the biggest AI exposure, who is the biggest AI darling, and then pump your money into that, because that basically has been what we've seen all year. Here's one of the angsts underpinning the market. At what point does this become something of a craze that has gotten over its skis, similar to what perhaps some of the electric vehicle hopes and dreams had? And that's sort of what we're seeing potentially with Tesla in addition to some other issues. Is it froth or is it justified? Two very different views we'll be discussing this hour. JP Morgan's Marco Kalanovic saying signs of froth are building. David Costner and Goldman basically saying the valuations are supported by fundamentals. So let's talk about the fundamentals of two names. I want to talk about Apple. I want to talk about Tesla and China specifically because deliveries for Tesla are struggle. And what we're seeing with China for Apple is arguably even worse over the last year. Given the fact that in the first six weeks of the year, uh, some independent data shows that its sales in China are down 24 percent. The key is, is this really because of a slowdown in the Chinese market? Is this because of a sort of de facto boycott in certain corners of Apple or U.S. products in China? Honestly, it's hard to pinpoint, but Apple already fell out of Goldman Sachs' uh, wish list. Anyway. If you're looking at patriotic buy, uh, buying, you can look at Huawei when it comes to Apple. You could choose a Huawei phone, which their sales are surging when it comes to smartphones. And then for Tesla's issue is BYD. But what I find so interesting is that Tesla and Apple are bro both either cutting prices or Tesla last week in China is offering this insurance subsidy, but it's still not enough to get their sales up and ramping. Yeah, let's draw a line between what's happening with smartphones and what's happening right now with EVs. EV is a struggle. EV is a struggle over in China because of competition. It's a struggle right here in the United States for a whole host of reasons. Adoption is just not increasing in the way that a lot of people hoped for just last year. We already saw that with Ford and GM coming out and pulling back. You know, it's so hard to know whether people are just getting ahead of their set in terms of their excitement for things and then to price that in. Because if you talk to the Ford CFO, he's going to say it will be an adoption cycle at some point. It just is a little bit faster, uh, is a little bit slower than we expected. With respect to Tesla, they're a car company. That's the dirty secret. They've been wanting to, treat, wanting to be treated like a, a tech company, but now they're a car company. And that was sort of solidified by Apple saying, we're done. Yeah, and maybe that requires a very different multiple. The stock was down 7% yesterday. It's down by another one point something percentage points so far this morning. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative by a quarter of 1%. The bond market shaping up as follows. A big two days coming up for Chairman Powell. That's just around the corner later this week. Your yield on a 10-year down by three basis points, 4.1837. In foreign exchange, the euro a touch weaker, dollar stronger, 108.50 on that currency pair. Coming up this hour, Samara Cohen of BlackRock as Wall Street wonders if the stock rally is a boom or a bubble. Pierre Farragut of New Street as Apple's China sales plunged 24%. And constant hunter of macro policy perspectives as upside risk to inflation cast doubt over the rate cut timeline. We begin with our top story, boom or bubble. With stocks hitting all-time highs, Wall Street is divided. JP Morgan's Marco Kalanovic warning of froth in markets and writing, quote, earnings projections for 24 are coming down and the market appears complacent on the cycle. Goldman's David Costin writing the following, this time is different. That's always dangerous. <laughs> we believe the valuation of the Magnificent Seven is currently supported by their fundamentals. Samara Cohen, ETF and index CIO of BlackRock joins us now for more. Samara, wonderful to see you. We've got a lot to talk about in crypto and Bitcoin. I just want to get to the equity market first. Boom or bubble, which one is it? Look, I think the important thing is that one of the Transform it. One of, one of the most transformed parts of markets today is participation of individual investors. So just to level set here, there are probably 100 million 
American investors who are self-directing their money. That's what we talk about. We say the self-directed investor. And about 30 percent of them are in iShares ETFs, are in ETFs, right? So investors are participating in single stocks, but they're also participating in broad-based uh, uh, indexes. And I think that gets lost a little bit. Now, we can extend this story to China, which you were talking about before, where interestingly, we are seeing there are emerging market ETFs that are ex-China that are seeing inflows. But there is also a lot of interesting options activity on China ETFs, which is one of the core ways that a U.S. investor can express a view on China. So what you're seeing there is actually bullish skew, probably four times as much call interest as put interest in getting a limit, limited, ups, limited downside participation in China. We hear the word trade versus investment. Trade versus investment. When they think about China, are they thinking trade? and not investment? Well, these are short dated calls. So I think we're talking about uh, short term limited downside participation and some upside. But so yes, I think the what we are seeing is kind of the transition from, let's say, savers to traders to investors in the United States. You talk about a lot of individual retail investors not going into a specific name, but trying to trade an index. How much are they essentially thinking they're trading some specific names given the dominance of those names in the index? How much has that drawn in retail interest in a new way? I think investors who want to trade an index are trading the index. It is incredibly easy. And, and you know, one, the, the reason we saw this real step up in participation over the pandemic that is now participated is that there is commission free trading for, you know, all stocks, uh, single stock or ETFs. There are much better experiences on digital platforms. And there's a lot of information for better or for worse coming through social media. So investors have the access to determine, do they want uh, single stock exposure? Do they want index exposure. So I think the decision to allocate into ETFs or index product is very specific to the index. Outcome. Even those people who already have allocated, I'm just wondering how you can gauge kind of the appetite for risk at a moment when there seems to be a lot already baked into valuations and people are getting concerned about some frothiness. Do you get the sense that retail investors are still gung ho and they're still saying this is the time to start moving money out of cash and locking in longer term yields, locking in some of the, uh, the sort of prominence of artificial intelligence. Absolutely. Well, it's artificial intelligence, but even upstream of that, I would say it's what does your fixed income allocation look like, of course, because last year was the year of cash. All of a sudden, a lot of these savers who are coming off the sidelines realized I have to do more than have my money sit in a bank account. I have opportunities in the cash market. Now the question is they have to start worrying about investment risk. Maybe they have a little bit more time than we thought before, given what we continue to learn from the Fed, but they have to think about their core fixed income allocations. And then to your point, they have to think about, you know, what, you know, and of course, this all depends on their time horizon. Where do they want their equity allocations to be on the risk spectrum? They've got a new option, a spot Bitcoin ETF. They do. Can you just frame how big the inflows have been over the last few weeks? Uh, well, I think it's important to look at the inflows in the context of the category, right? So there haven't been there haven't been ETFs on Bitcoin, and this is the first time ever we saw you know ETFs enter an asset class. And at the beginning, the question was, do investors want to hold uh, uh, any particular? They have more options to participate in the Bitcoin market than they than they did before. But the inflows have definitely uh, gotten attention. Would you call it new money? That's what I'm trying to work out. Is it from the crypto universe just being put into the spot Bitcoin ETF because that's where people would prefer it to be? Or is it coming from elsewhere? Stuff that was previously invested in equities, in fixed income, that is coming to this market for the first time? So I've seen lots of different analysis on this. And I would say the range between how much is new money kind of is between 50% and 75% that's new money, with the early days in particular being uh, um, you know, recycling from other wrappers. And you can see that in the trading volumes as well. If I look across the Bitcoin trading complex, spot, futures, ETFs, ETFs were probably about 15% of trading volume in those early days. Now it's leveled down to call it you know, 6 to 8%. What do you see in terms of uh, the sort of evolution of this year, where people are sort of shifting their investment uh, strategies at a time where yields are higher but expected to come down, and there is this discussion about a rotation or something shifting in the equity space? So number one, it is really determining what the appropriate fixed income allocation for them should be and where that is on the yield curve. And this is part of this bigger picture regime shift. How do you think about the portfolio uh, you know, now that we've had this, you know, change and how we think about change in 40 years where you have new investors who've never really had to consider inflation before. So that's number one. And then number two, as you said, is where do they go in their equity allocation? 
There was a great piece uh, on the Bloomberg talking about the return profile of cash versus actually investment grade and, uh, and, and, and just uh, government debt. And it actually shows that T-bills has outperformed over the past 10 years or basically been in line. How do you shift mentalities that have been entrenched by that and say this time is different? I think education plays an incredibly important role here. Um, and that's one of the things that uh, uh, investors are looking to their advisors for, looking to media for, looking to digital platforms for. But there is just no question that that is probably one of the biggest risks to those, you know, 100 million investors who are in the market right now. The biggest risks are probably, number one, the reinvestment risk if they're not, you know, moving out onto the yield curve. And number two, the diversification risk, you know, if they are looking to uh, more volatile uh, uh, single stock or even crypto exposure. Speaking only. of diversification, this is what I struggle with, with Bitcoin, and I'd love your answer to it. What are the characteristics of it in the context of a broader portfolio? What is it there for? What is it useful at? I mean, I understand the volatility and I understand for people that want to play it, it makes a lot of sense with regards to that. But in the context of a broader portfolio, what characteristics does it offer me that I can't get from another asset class? So I am going to answer that first with what you already know. Like the number one characteristic that we do know is volatility. The number two thing that we know, and this is really what led to the SEC approving Bitcoin ETFs, is that investors are buying it. They want to be in it. We were hearing from advisors that they wanted another tool and toolkit in order to let their clients who were calling them allocate uh, to Bitcoin. But I think what we will be watching for the rest of the year and what will be really significant is what are the use cases in portfolio allocations? There's lots, you know, well, I would say it's kind of an emerging body of research that's being written. But We're I still figuring it out. That's the space to watch. There are some strong convictions, um, but I think what we, as when it, we start to see model allocations, including uh, Bitcoin, and we should be very specific, we're talking about Bitcoin here, not any sure. of the other crypto assets. Um, I think that's going to be an important story for 2024 in the use of ETFs. Is it uncorrelated risk? Is it for risk mitigation? What is it for? I'm still trying to figure that out too. Well, I think that if you say uncorrelated, it seems to be pretty correlated to risk on appetite. This year. So, you know, at what point is it actually uncorrelated versus just if you want sort of to feel cool? Is that what it's for, to feel cool? I mean, with your kids. Hey, kids, I've got a Bitcoin. I'm, I wouldn't go that far. Bitcoin right now is negative. I mean, maybe. <laughs> We're down by about 0.8% this morning. Samara, you're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. Samara Cohen of BlackRock sticking with us. Let's give you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Target is gaining pre-market up some 7.4%. Fourth quarter earnings beat estimates with better inventory management. Target has faced headwinds with fewer shoppers buying discretionary items thanks to higher inflation and interest rates. It also launched a membership program to rival Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus. China set an ambitious 5% economic growth target for this year, putting renewed pressure on the nation's top leaders to unleash more stimulus to lift confidence in an economy hit by a property slump and entrenched deflation. Analysts surveyed by Bloomberg forecast the economy will expand by 4.6% in 2024. Counterpoint Research says iPhone sales in China fell 24% in the first six weeks of the year. To stimulate demand, Apple had offered a rare discount on its website in January. Apple fell 16% to a market share from 19% a year ago, according to the researchers. Apple has fallen 9% since the start of the year and lost the title of the world's most valuable company to Microsoft. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Danny, thank you. Home next on this program, on course for a rematch in November. It is Super Tuesday, um, but this really is more of a, a stress test for the general election between former President Trump and current um, President uh, Biden. I think this nomination will be wrapped up in about two weeks. Trump-Biden, volume two, that conversation up next, live from New York City this morning. Good morning. Stocks on the S&P 500 negative here by 0.2%. It's a subtle pullback on the S&P 500. Yield to lower by three basis points, 418.57 on a 10-year. Under surveillance this morning, on course for a rematch in November. It is Super Tuesday, um, but this really is more of a, a stress test for the general election between former President Trump and current um, President uh, Biden. I think this nomination will be wrapped up in about two weeks. 
Nikki Haley, again, she's looking to get uh, the prize without the winning, but it's quite possible that her voters are the ones that can unlock a general election win for either Trump or possibly Joe Biden. Here's the latest today. Donald Trump and Nikki Haley going head-to-head -head across 15 GOP primaries. Trump expected to tighten his grip on the Republican nomination, moving closer to a rematch with President Biden in November. Joining us to discuss is Bloomberg's Josh Wingrove. Josh, out of those 15 GOP primaries, can Nikki Haley win one? Well, she won the D.C. primary, John. We don't talk about that, you know, big one here. Uh, you know, I think expectations are pretty low. Uh, but that being said, one of the big questions, of course, is whether Nikki Haley is going to drop out. You know, I think you, our guest there that you played the clip of said that this could be wrapped up in a couple of weeks. I think it's wrapped up now, essentially. Donald Trump, by all, uh, for all intents and purposes, is going to be the nominee. The party's acting like the, he's the nominee. Uh, Joe Biden, of course, is going to be his party's nominee, barring some sort of shock surprise. And so this is where we're at, and this is where we're going. I think one thing that's been interesting to watch is even in these races where Donald Trump has cruised to big victories over Nikki Haley, he's actually underperforming his polls. He's not beating her by as much as the polls indicate. So I, I'll be watching for that tonight. Is there continued sort of polling error that overstates Trump's support in this primary? That, of course, is what the Biden people are hoping for because all the polls right now, including the Bloomberg Morning Consult poll, show Trump leading Biden. And if the polls are overstating his race against Haley. You might wonder whether they're overstating the race against Biden. As for Biden, what we're watching for today is whether he has more of that protest vote factor in states like North Carolina. We saw this in Michigan, where the uncommitted vote was encouraged for Arab, Arab American voters, Muslim American voters, progressives who were upset about the situation in Gaza. So that's sort of the like undercurrent on both of them. But broadly speaking, it'll be a good night for Joe Biden. It'll be a good night for Donald Trump. And this is the starting gun to the 2024 race. Well, Josh, for the undercurrent for Trump, it looks like he has a steep hill to climb when it comes to general election, given even though she's losing, the percentage of votes Nikki Haley is still getting in some of these primaries. You were at the White House yesterday with Mark Cuban. You were tweeting about it. And you asked him, and he cast a ballot in the Texas primary for Nikki Haley. But he said when it comes to the general he's going to back Biden over the former president. How many of people, people are like that in the United States that Trump is going to have to have a difficult time picking up? This is the million-dollar question, Anne-Marie. I think we should be asking every Nikki Haley voter walking out of that primary, hey, what are you going to do in November? Because not only are they voting for her, but demographically, Haley's voters look nothing like Trump's voters. And so the question, they, they frankly look a lot more like the coalition Biden put together. So the question is, do these people stay home? Do they hold their nose and vote for Donald Trump? Do they hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden? We just don't know right now. And I think that that is just such a key factor. Cuban told me that his vote for Haley was explicitly a, quote, protest vote against Donald Trump. And not only did he say he'd vote for Joe Biden, he waved off some of the age concerns. He said, if they were giving Biden his last rights, I would still vote for him over Donald Trump. Wow, that's something. So Thursday, we're going to get a sense of how the president is doing and the policies he'd like to enact if he got four more years. What are you looking for for the State of the Union? Yeah, I think this is where, you know, Biden's sort of big campaign kickoff speech, for lack of a better phrase. We're going to hear a lot about costs. We're going to hear a lot about stuff that you and I, who've been watching this, have heard before, but they kind of have struggled to get the message out. They passed an infrastructure bill. Not really a lot of people know about it. They passed a chips bill. Not really a lot of people know about it. By the way, we're going to hear billions of announcements over the next month, I imagine, on that chips bill on infrastructure. So brace yourselves for that. They'll be rolling out a lot of stuff on that. He wants to basically give the theory of the case that they are governing, essentially, and that he deserves another term for governing. governing. Of course, what our poll showed, 82% of voters think Biden is too old or that both Biden and Trump are too old. One, a lot of the question on Thursday will be, on his delivery, can he quell concerns, including concerns within his party, not just with Republicans, about his age and, and sort of rally the troops. And of course, on Monday, we're expecting the federal budget, Biden's budget, to be announced, his sort of wish list Congress. That's sort of a message setting document. So these are sort of the three dominoes to really kick things off. We've got Super Tuesday, we've got the State of the Union, and then the budget, and they're off to the races. Uh, Josh, I want to pick up on something you repeated. Not a lot of people know about it. I, for one, am sick to death of politicians who blame the media for that. They have a responsibility as well. What are they doing about that? How are they changing their approach when they engage with media? Is he going to do more interviews? What are they doing to change that? He's starting to do more. We saw a magazine piece drop yesterday that he gave an interview for. Biden gives very few interviews. He gave a couple to radio stations in North Carolina that will air today. Of course, they've got their primary, and that's sort of a reach swing state for Democrats in the, in the election. 
So they're trotting him out more. And of course, they you know fight the age question by saying, well, in private, Biden is you know very like commanding and very you know, perceptive, and he drills down on questions. And uh, you know they obviously have an opportunity to show more of that in public if they do more interviews. They will be fanning out principles as well that aren't named Joe Biden. We saw Jill Biden, for instance, do a swing state tour these past few days. Cabinet secretaries will be everywhere, in particular those half a dozen or so swing states talking about these things. But it's funny because Joe Biden always told the Obama people way back when that they weren't taking a victory lap enough. They weren't telling people what they'd done. They weren't talking about Obamacare. And he really set out to change that. And he's kind of ended up in kind of a similar trap where just the demands of the presidency pile up. You've got to deal with stuff like Gaza or whatnot. Uh, and you end up not doing as much sort of roadshow, you know, retail politics as you might want. So right now, they some of their flagship stuff, just, you know, awareness is not high on it. Like that infrastructure bill, like that chips bill, I think they'll be sort of screaming it from the rooftops. But the question is whether it's too late. Hey, Josh, good to hear from you. Josh Wingrove there down in D.C. Funny's the right word, because this whole thing about him having energy behind closed doors has become a joke in comedy sketches here in America. Well... <laughs> It's sort of like everyone's, yes, at a certain point, show us, and if not, then really that's your biggest pitch. Just taking a step back, though, this idea of why they haven't advertised some of their accomplishments, I think it actually is a pretty deep point. Because the question is, do they have a cohesive message that caters to all sides of the party and the sort of populace that they want to trot out? Or don't they? Is that part of the problem and the reason why you're not touting some accomplishments, whether it's, you know, lowering gas prices, which they say, but how do they do that? Or if it's something like some of the fiscal spending that's contributing to the deficit, but also has supported the economy. Samara, I wanted a final word from you on the politics. Forgive me. I keep doing this every single day. I turn to the guest on markets this (laughs) night. Forgive me. We've got to talk about politics. What are you advocating for ahead of November? Just ignore it for now. What are you telling people? Look, what we know is that four out of five Americans are worried about their financial well-being in retirement. So whoever wins, we know a couple of things are really important. Number one, monetary policy is independent. That's intentional. Investors have to figure out their uh, uh, fixed income allocations, particularly with Fed easing on the horizon. And number two, equity markets will reshape to accommodate the demands of increased participation of individual investors, whether that is in crypto, whether that is in single stocks. And that is going to be, it needs to be a priority of either administration. And that individual investor participation has risen over both Trump and Biden uh, administrations measurably. Is that another way of saying stocks will go up, regardless of who's in the White House? Uh, Historically, when the economy grows, stocks go up, and that has been true uh, uh, generally in election years, and that would be a good thing for the increasing participation of individual investors. Samara, it was great to catch up with you. Thank you. Samara Cohen of BlackRock, stocks go up. I would go back to Japan and the conversation we had earlier this week. We've been conditioned in America the stocks only go up. You do get lost decades. You get lost decades in Japan, lost decades in certain markets in Hong Kong, in certain markets in Europe, even in certain markets in tech in America. We had basically a lost decade. For a long, long time, we had more than that. So, Bramo, these things can happen. And the reason that people care about this is the why behind it. Is it a demographic issue, as it was partly in Japan? Is it also some of the, uh, the investment or lack of it? I wonder for the U.S., is it also the deficit issues? If you start to see yields rise really considerably, what that does to certain asset valuations and some of the growth projections going forward. One thing that is assured is deficits and a bigger debt pile and more bond supply, right? You know, I just think we can agree on that. I just want, are we going to have a Liz Trust moment? I mean, really, I mean, I just wonder if we're going to have something like that, you know, where basically the bond markets are like, absolutely not. Take that back. I'm not sure the Treasury market wants a Liz Trust moment. No. I think a list trust moment caused some chaos in global markets for like five minutes. I'm not sure a list trust moment in treasury markets would be shaken off quite so well. <laughs> no, it would be intense. Two-year yields are lower by two basis points. This right now is not a list trust moment. 458 <laughs> on a two-year. Coming up next, Apple sales in China falling 24% according to data from Counterpoint. That conversation with Pierre Faragou of New Street up next. Two-day winning streak on the S&P 500 snapped yesterday, down a little bit lower this morning. We're down a quarter of 1% on the S&P, down a half of 1% on the Nasdaq 100. There are some single-name stories we need to talk about. Tesla, Apple, we'll do that in a moment. In the bond market, two-year, 10-year, 30-year, Bramo has a new warning. List trust moment stateside. 
Maybe, possibly, later this year. <laughs> totally. That's on my list of Could worries. Could be. I mean, not later this year. Actually, that's not true. If it depends on what we get. If we get some sort of package that talks about increasing the deficit dramatically and no one's looking for that and you have inflation, well... Let's see. That's the point. Context matters. What does the growth backdrop look like? What does the inflation backdrop look like? If we do have reinflation risk and that manifests, materializes by the end of the year, if you do have robust growth in America and yields are somewhere close to 5%, so that's a lot of ifs, but if all that lines up and then you have a president come into power that says, guess what, we're going to push even harder here, go even harder on growth, domestic growth, and we're going to put up the barriers to importing that deflation from China then you've got potentially that kind of pushback. But this goes back to a question I've asked. Does Washington still have the privilege of behaving recklessly? Do you believe they do? Because Liz Truss in the gilt market is not the president of the United States in the treasury market. That is a very, very different thing. For now. I mean, I'm just saying, it, correct. The US Granted. and the UK are completely different uh, in many, many ways. That said, I have been thinking a lot about this because if you get the recipe you're talking about and then you get someone who comes in and has a much more protectionist policy, which is both inflationary and possibly negative for growth, that's the problem at a time where there are people on the periphery saying it's starting to matter a little bit more that we have this kind of deficit. I think that would be the definition of running things hot, <laughs> just a little <laughs> bit. It's like putting the microwave on and turning the US economy up. Equity futures then slightly negative in the FX market. We are negative by a tenth of 1% on the euro. The euro coming down to about 108.48. Under Savannah this morning, we've got to talk about Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin nearing an all-time high as demand for new ETFs using a cryptocurrency as well as a looming reduction in supply growth drives gains. Bitcoin's price surging nearly 160% in the past six months, taking its market cap to a record 1.35 trillion US dollars. That spot Bitcoin ETF was not a sounder news moment. No, which is sort of surprising. And it raises this question of why is this basically institutions that are uh, rallying to the asset class? Is this individuals coming back in? It doesn't feel the same kind of to have the same kind of frothiness that it has in the past where everybody was going into Dogecoin and meme coins and everything else. But kind of it is there sort of is this sort of NFT feeling as well that's happening on the periphery. You heard it from BlackRock. Institutional adoption is part of this. But I was trying to work out how much of this is new money. Is this a new wrapper and people are just taking the money from elsewhere within the crypto universe and placing it in a BlackRock ETF? Or is it truly new money coming from other asset classes, coming from cash on the sidelines? Got a pretty strong, strong suggestion it was more of the latter than the former. Especially because you, we even heard this from investors who came on here who said that there, that was their diversifier, perhaps even better than bonds, because it isn't sort of subject to the higher uh, potential rates due to inflation. I just wonder, diversify from what? You raise that, which again, it's a risk on asset class. When does Bitcoin rally when everything else is in a negative That's place? what I was surprised at from BlackRock. What is the place of Bitcoin in the context of a broader portfolio? What are the characteristics that I'm getting from that asset class that I'm not getting from elsewhere? And the answer was kind of like we're finding out. We don't really know. Yeah, and that's basically what we hear from a lot of people, except for some of the people where it's, it's sort of a religious feeling of, you know, this idea of what gets replaced in terms of the modern way of money. And I, I don't know that we really have gotten that in a full scale adoption, but you feel that energy sometimes. That energy, is that what you're calling it? You're saying that religious type energy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like the followers. It's, it's very sure. much a, a religious. Uh, uh, anyway, move on. Bitcoin is down by 0.7%. Are you like imagining the hate mail you're about to get in the next... Few minutes. Stop knowing yeah, me just so for, well. Forward, just move on. Forward all look, emails I, to TK. Okay, look, just forward honestly, all emails to TK. I'm all for it. I'm all for financial innovation. I'm all for trying sure. to understand this. I just sure. wonder if you Wait, have this digital gold moment. You're describing you know, a cult almost. Well, I'm just saying that there are people who Don't really believe Don't tell me. Just, you know, they're there. Just down a barrel of the camera. Tell I think. Me. I think that... I want to learn more about it and I want Good. to understand if we can get you know, a full adoption. I also think that it does raise questions about cross-border kinds of transfers of payments. And Good that save. I think is really uh, interesting. Good save. Actually. Nice. Let's turn to Target. Shares <laughs> jumping in the pre-market after fourth quarter earnings topped estimates. The retail giant reducing its inventory by about 12%, limiting the amount of risk associated with markdowns in store and digital traffic declined for a third consecutive quarter, but at a slower and narrower pace than analyst expectations. Tesla Target rather also confirming it will launch its own membership program going up against rival efforts such as Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus. That stock is flying in the pre-market high here by almost 8%. Yeah, well, and basically they're turning it around, right? They had seen this sort of slow decline of growth and they're pointing to a sense that maybe they'll have uh, some sort of growth. 
To me, what I find interesting is the new model of these stores. It's having a loyalty program. It's having some sort of shipping apparatus that they're going to have in the back rooms. And it's beauty products. I mean, honestly, that's the only one piece of it, but really the Ulta Beauty. I find that really interesting. There's huh? some big difficulties last year yeah. around Pride Month and they're moving on. But that was a real lesson for the business world almost 12 months ago, you know. We, you know, we saw that with Budweiser too. And AB InBev actually turned it around too. Yeah. So it was a blip, but, but that's the reason why you're seeing this real pushback against a lot of this stuff. I understand conservatives are giving Bud Light a second chance. Giving them a, a second chance. Would you like to say something about that? No, I'm... No, Give them a second chance. We're all on board. I don't even drink Bud Light. <laughs> you don't drink alcohol. <laughs> Sales of Apple's iPhones in China falling 24% during the first six weeks of the year, according to data from Counterpoint Research. It's the latest blow for Apple in the world's biggest smartphone market, with local rival Huawei seeing sales surge 64%. In the same period, Apple introduced rare discounts on some devices earlier this year to stimulate demand, while online sellers cut prices by as much as $180. For more, Pierre Fadigou of New Street Research joins us now. Neutral rating on Apple with a price target of $175. Pierre, wonderful to catch up with you because you are perfectly positioned to talk about these two stories. These two names, Apple, Tesla, both fall under your coverage. Pierre, can you tell us whether there's any crossover in the challenges that those two names are facing in two very different industries in China. Thanks, John. Yes, if you look at um, at Apple, really, it's a competition. Um, it's mostly a competition is, is, issue. The, the overall smartphone market in China is weak, down seven percent. You know, over two months, it's not like a massively significant data point. We'll have to wait to see how things evolve beyond uh, beyond February and the Chinese New Year. Um, the, the big piece of news is that Huawei now is on the run rate of selling 3 million units um, a month, roughly, and they were selling like barely 2 million units a month a year ago. So Huawei is back in China. They were not able to do phones for quite a while because they couldn't access chips manufactured at TSMC anymore. anymore. Now they figured out a way to do chips domestically on mainland China. They are back and Chinese consumers like to buy Huawei phones. Remember 2021. Uh, the iPhone 12, we were expecting a very weak cycle. Uh, we were expecting uh, uh, Apple um, units to come down from 235 million units to 200 million, uh, if not lower. It did not happen in 2021. Huawei disappeared from the map. Apple benefited a lot in China. This is um, this is now coming back. Le, le, le Huawei is coming back and Apple is probably going to lose significant share in China this year. That's really what's happening for them. Pierre, we've been identifying three separate themes. One is just overall Chinese growth. The other is the competition you've just spoken to. The third piece, I think, is really difficult to break out. And I wonder how you get a read on this. Rising consumer nationalism in China, in the mainland. How do you break that out, Pierre? How do you identify some of that? Yeah, I, I think that that was on the table in 2021 as well. Um, at, at the time, remember, Huawei was doing very well. And, and, and there was a feeling that le, le, the Chinese consumer was uh, was pushing back on, a, on US products and on the iPhone. Um, I think we need to wait six more months to, to get a feel for that. Is Huawei coming back to where they were in, 20, in 2020 or early 2021? Or do they continue to gain share against Apple? This is going to be um, our answer. Because remember that without Huawei, the Chinese market doesn't really have an alternative in the high end to uh, uh, to Apple, like a Chinese alternative. So we need to have Huawei in the game and see if we see sustained share again, then that would be a sign that nationalism um, is, um, is at play. Something that both Apple and Tesla have done is cut prices. Do you think we could see more of that? So um, really the cutting prices is a big theme in the, in the auto industry. You've, um, um, the, the difficulties there are more like um, market-wide and structural. Le, all EV makers have had to lower their prices a lot in order to maintain demand. We've seen a game of market share moving back and forth between BYD and Tesla. In, in the first uh, two months of the year, quite surprisingly, something that the market didn't catch well, um, Tesla actually did much better than BYD and regained share against, um, uh, against BYD. But overall, in a market that remain, remains very, very slow, very, um, uh, uh, very, uh, very weak, and so you continue to see um, uh, price cuts. But most of them are behind us. If you look at how Tesla is cutting prices today, they are like lowering prices on an insurance product, or they are cutting prices on like an option, like a different color. 
things like that, which means that the base price is not moving anymore, which is a positive. So on balance, Tesla, first two months of the year, doing better than BYD, uh, no core price cuts anymore. I think Tesla is more or less finding a floor in uh, uh, in China and in a place where they can maintain the kind of volumes they've been setting in the country um, in uh, in recent months. There's a larger question, Pierre, and I'd love it if you could address it about whether the big tech frenzy that we're seeing in the United States is going to be dampered or is vulnerable to a reality check in China, a reality check when it comes to demand, a reality check when it comes to being able to sell, uh, when it comes to AMD, for example, creating a special chip just for China, and then the U.S. government saying that's not good enough. At what point are some of these risks accurately priced throughout the entire Magnificent Seven complex? Yeah, it's a great question, and I think it's it's really on a on a name by name basis that you uh, you get an answer to that, and you, you need to dig um, quite deep into the numbers to uh, to get a sense for it. So, for Apple, for instance, we think that if Huawei really comes back to where they were in 2020 and early 2021, there is downside to expectations for Apple this year. Um, uh, maybe like a further 10 million unit cut or 5%, uh, 4 or 5% of, uh, uh, of volumes. So, so there is a bit of downside and, and it's a headwind on, on, the, on stocks. On the chip side, most players have been very cautious. I don't know specifically for AMD, I'm trying to speak to them today to figure it out. Um, but most players have been very cautious not taking into account China into their guide. And remember that today, chip is gold. Uh, there is a cheap rush. Everybody wants to buy more cheap. So anything you don't sell in China today in the cheap market, you, you're going to sell it elsewhere. So I wouldn't be um, I wouldn't be too, wor too worried. You take a step back and you take a, a broader picture. And on the longer term horizon, China is more or less 20 percent of like the tech ecosystem when it comes to end market and domestic end market. And, and that 20 percent is coming down for, for sure. Like it's going to get, to get more and more difficult to sell. Uh, Western technology into China because you'll have regulatory constraints and also because China wants to grow more independent. But I think it's a 10, 15, 20 year process to see like, you know, this silicon curtain growing between China and the rest of the world in terms of technology. And that's a headwind that is here to stay for sure. So just to encapsulate it, it sounds like maybe Apple and Tesla haven't fully priced in, or at least that seems to be the uh, the appearance in today's market, the risk from China. The other stocks are more insulated because they already have not been necessarily pricing in any kind of benefit from China. Is that kind of what I'm hearing from you? Yes, exactly. Especially in the semiconductor, on the semiconductor side of things and the, the semiconductor value chain, yes. Hey, Pierre, this was great. Just wonderful to get your perspective on such an important story for a number of names this morning. Pierre Farago there of New Street. This is way more nuanced, obviously, from company to company, from industry to industry. And that's what we're hearing about, and that's the reason why you say, what's the linkage even between Tesla and Apple? Considering they're two different industries with very different dynamics. That said, there clearly is a sea change, both with respect to demand in China, and that's been going on for years, but also with respect to just the willingness to buy U.S. made products. Big time. Both those names are down in the pre-market this morning. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere today. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. NYCB is higher pre-market after another plunge and more downgrades. Shares of the company dropped to a 1996 low, falling 43% in two days. Fitch cut its re rating and Moody's lowered theirs again after already having the bank at junk. NYCB has lost more than two-thirds of its value this year. Elon Musk has lost his position at the top of the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. Tesla tumbled 7.2% yesterday. Jeff Bezos is back at the top with more than $200 billion versus Musk's $198 billion. The wealth gap between the pair was once $142 billion, but it's been shrinking with Amazon shares doubling since 2022 and Tesla with it down 50% from its 21 peak. The International Space Station has four new residents after the successful docking of SpaceX Dragon spacecraft. Three NASA astronauts and one Russian cosmonaut will oversee the arrival of two new rocket ships during their six-month stay. Boeing's new Starliner capsule with test pilots is due to arrive in late April. Sierra's Space Dream Chaser mini shuttle is due a month or two later. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Very cool. Danny, thank you. Up next on the program, upside risk to inflation, muddying the path to rate cuts. How can the Fed cut? When inflation expectations are continuing to much higher, it really is a major challenge for the Fed here, where you both have a tailwind as a result of their own actions, but also with the market now saying that inflation expectations are continuously drifting higher.
Torsten Slok of Apollo, so punchy about this. No rate cuts in 2024. We'll discuss that call next on the program. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Lisa getting so much love right now. How's that going, Bramo? Uh, you could come back to me next year. Okay, you let us know. You work <laughs> through those emails. Equity futures on the S&P. I told you, just forward them to TK. Oh, All right. Great. What does he call Bitcoin? Bitdog. Yeah, well, I mean, okay. Just, just let like, him already, take it. Yeah, but I don't want to be, like, correlated with that. You, you don't want to be correlated I, with Tom. <laughs> no, in terms of, you know, <laughs> right, right, sort right, of, okay. like, Equities no, are down. his dismissal sure. of the whole asset mm, class. Okay. TK, if you're listening, we're down about a third of 1% on the S&P. Right. Under surveillance this morning, right. upside risk to inflation, muddying the path to rate cuts. We need then financial conditions to begin to tighten. And given that's not happening every day, including today, you're seeing more and more signs of easing. How can the Fed cut when inflation expectations are continuing to march higher? It really is a major tra challenge for the Fed here, where you both have a tailwind as a result of their own actions, but also with the market now saying that inflation expectations are continuously drifting higher. Here's the latest today. The Fed's Rafael Bostic warning of, quote, pent-up exuberance, posing an upside risk to inflation if the Fed cuts too quickly. Constant Hunter, macro policy perspectives, not sharing those concerns, writing this. A a series of cuts in June or July will likely allow the economy to capitalise on the productivity surge underway and could allow for a repeat of the second half of the 1990s where growth accelerated and the price level declined. Constance with us around the table here in New York. Constance, good morning. Good morning. Why is Thorsten's Glock of Apollo wrong in your opinion? Well, I think there's a few things. Um, when you have a productivity surge like we are having right now, you can have the economy continue to be fairly strong while inflation continues to moderate. So uh, Laura Rosner on our team, who is an inflation guru, has, com has a forecast that we'll have in hand for the Fed by June uh, a 2.1% year-over-year handle on PCE. So they will have data that could allow them to cut. And then you have to ask the question about where should real rates be? Now, of course, this is we don't know the full answer to this, but let's say they were to cut they're, they're 75 basis points this year. You go from very restrictive to still moderately restrictive. And so you still have restrictive rates um, within the economy. I also think that um, you know, the financial conditions that we all look at on Wall Street um, are not necessarily the financial conditions that the average consumer faces, right? So the average consumer is dealing with you know, higher interest rates on credit cards, higher interest rates on auto loans, inability to, to or you know, home mortgages being so high that they're priced out of purchasing a home. So yes, if you own stocks, financial conditions are easier. If you don't and you're younger or you're, you're not in that demographic, you still have pretty tight financial conditions. So you're downplaying the contribution from equity markets at all-time highs, credit markets being super loose just in terms of the ability to come to market, issue debt, and that debt's being brought. Is that not that important to the reacceleration we've seen in the economy over the last six months? So I th we don't think that that reacceleration is going to continue apace in the first half of this year. What do you think fueled it? What underpinned it, in your opinion? Well, there were a number of things. I mean, you had an inventory buildup, but you also had productivity, right? Like productivity was, productivity surged in the third quarter. It continued to grow strongly in the fourth quarter. We think that there is a lot underpinning this productivity story. So aside from the obvious, right, AI, and I'm not even talking about generative AI, just basic AI, large language models, firms are still implementing those because if you're a large firm and you have legacy, um, uh, IT, you have a number of different programs. So first you need to downsize and, and right size all of the different apps and, and different programs you're running so the data can talk to each other before you can even harness um, the power of AI, right? So that process has been underway and now firms are beginning to use just basic AI to help improve their operations. So what are the challenges right now? A lot of people, sorry. It's okay. I, I'll let you finish sorry. in a minute. But I, one of the things that people are saying is that all of these things are getting baked in in terms of AI and the productivity gains are we misplacing when this story comes to fruition, given the fact that the data still seems to suggest quite a bit of inflation, and the data still seems to suggest that things are maybe heating up more than they are cooling down? So 
Let's unpack that, right? What parts of the data are showing really high prices? So we know that, for example, um, what's been happening in vehicle prices has, has been coming through into CPI with a lag, right? And so we're go we expect those prices to begin moderating. In, um, insurance prices have been high. So whether it's homeowner's insurance or auto insurance is one of the things that has risen the most since the beginning of the pandemic and continued to go up, um, you know, last year and in, in the recent print, right? So that we expect not to continue going up at the same pace. Insurers took this opportunity to, to get market pricing power. They're not gonna be able to continue doing that at the same pace. And then of course, there's that big OER component and what happened with the reweighting um, and how rents are gonna play through. And so we do see um, market rents are coming down and are actually negative year over year. All that's gonna play through over the next six months. There's disinflation and then there's weakness. Is there a real risk right now if the Fed doesn't cut rates for a bit longer to wait to see some of the data that you're talking about come into play? Oh, I am not. I think that it pays for them to be cautious on so many different levels, right? That's their job. They need to be measured. They need to be careful. And because you have this productivity, it gives them extra policy space, right? They can wait a little longer because the economy is strong enough. Uh, one of the things that, that we are looking at very closely is what's happening in the labor market, of course. And for this Friday's report, one of the things we're going to be looking at is really what's happening with hours worked, right? How much of January was weather? It seems like it was more than weather. And we do web scraping of company earnings. And what we see both in the data and the comments is that firms are actually using hours to continue with labor hoarding, right? They don't want to lay people off, but they don't have as much work for them to do. And so, and when I talk to some of our clients, like some of our clients are mid-sized banks, and they say that like, like when they speak to their clients, there's weakness out there. So firms that aren't coming to the market to, to issue debt, firms that have to rely on banks and other credit sources are not seeing easy credit conditions. You write in your note under the hood, you have concerns of the labor market. So is that what it is? They're not laying off people, but they're restricting them so much to the, basically the least amount of hours they could work to keep them on? Yes, exactly. And so they're, they're saying we don't want to let people go. But what that means, of course, is less weekly or hourly earnings, or less weekly earnings in people's pockets, right? So there, so you saw earnings go down, actual earnings go down in January because hours worked fell. Looking for hours worked to climb, maybe, on Friday, the estimate well, we're in our looking, survey. Not necessarily. I'm going for our estimate okay. first. You can jump in in a second. 34.3, previous number 34.1. What are you looking for? So we're, we're looking for them to stay about the same, and okay. we're hoping that they actually come up a little bit because um, th then that would confirm that there was some weather effect in January, which certainly we had a lot of weather happening. But if they decline in line with this survey, then it would suggest that this labor hoarding story has, sh has shifted to a new phase where in order to continue labor hoarding, firms have to reduce hours. Interesting. Constant, good to see you. Thanks for being here in New York. Constant Hunter there of Macro Policy Perspectives. The other numbers in our survey, sneak peek of that for you, going into Friday, 200K is the estimate in our survey at the moment. That's the median estimate. Of course, you'll all remember the previous number was a blowout 353,000 that none of us were looking for, Bramo. I'm curious to see the revisions. I want to understand just how if things... If 353 is really exactly. 353. Exactly. I mean, because how much have we seen the revisions downward afterwards that revised downward by about 100,000 jobs? I mean, how much are we going to see that kind of revision and everyone's going to trade off the revisions? I said at the start of the week, it's a long road to 8.31 Eastern time on Friday. Got a lot to get through this week, including a double dose of Chairman Powell as well and a State of the Union address on Thursday evening. Coming up in the next hour, to look ahead to all of that, Elise Ossenbar of JP Morgan, Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital, Lauren Goodwin of New York Life Investments and Tom Narian of RBC Capital Markets. A lot to talk about in this market and some single names as well with Tesla and Apple down in the pre-market. Equity futures on the S&P 500, negative here by a third of 1%. As we head towards some economic data a little bit later this morning, a few hours away, it's the ISM Services Index. Going into it, the bond market bid. Yields are lower by three basis points. The 10-year, 418.37. On a two-year, down two basis points to 458. The third hour of Bloomberg Surveillance, up next.
we are starting to approach a little bit of euphoria here. The tailwind that's coming from easy financial conditions is really not surprising. There's a begrudging acceptance in the investment community that this economy is really not nearly as fragile as people think. The economy because of AI and technology might keep on growing. That's the biggest actually potential market surprise. Maybe, just maybe, we could have stronger job growth with inflation coming down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Anne-Marie Hordern. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the third hour begins right now and in many ways the week begins in a couple of hours from now 10 a.m eastern time when we get the ism services index that's going to start really the big big run of economic data that you get through the week which climaxes and concludes with payrolls on friday ism services do we get a pick up there bramo going into chairman powell tomorrow i would argue that actually could be the most market moving aspect of today given the fact that we did see that expansion uh last month we did see a higher than expected increase in prices paid do we continue to see that at a time where everyone's banking on Goldilocks and disinflation, even with strong growth. Do we get that? And will this be a read, a reality check? My favorite line so far this week was from Kit Jukes of SockGen, who said the U.S. dollar was feeding on a diet rich in U.S. exceptionalism. Really, just to frame that, think about the economic data we're looking for Friday, 200K on payrolls, 3.7% on unemployment. China puts out a 5% GDP growth target, and everyone's like, eh, can you hit it? Can you hit it? And there's some big doubts about whether they can. And part of the reason why is because they don't want to borrow more money and they want to continue with their deleveraging. So if they want to, bar they want to continue deleveraging, where are they going to pay for this? That's a serious issue. And the fact that they're not giving any kind of conclusive ideas to that has left everyone kind of... I don't know, lacking. And least. that market is the reason that Apple is down this morning by 2%. That market is the reason why Tesla got absolutely hammered in yesterday's session. And that weakness continues through to today as well. Well, Premier Lee said it himself. It's not easy for us to realize these targets as they put out these targets. That's why everyone is shrugging all of this off. When it comes to Tesla and Apple, they're dealing with growth issues when it comes to both the EV market and the smartphone market in China. And then we keep coming back to this idea. Is it growth versus is it this idea of patriotic buying? Why would you buy a Tesla in China, potentially, if you maybe could buy a BYD at a cheaper price point and also weighs the Chinese Communist Party flag? Same with Apple. They're cutting prices, but Huawei is doing pretty well with their new phone. So I woke up this morning and I thought, OK, the list of worries. Is there anything new to put on it? Right. And Nouriel Roubini basically no, blew Nouriel being bullish, just top, top of the pile. <laughs> Nouriel Roubini being a bull. Um, you know, there's some other concerns that I have as well. But this is a new one. Is the China risk not adequately priced into the big top tech bet, right? I mean, that's sort of one key question. Is it really just specific names that could potentially be affected? Or is there some sort of broader story here that hasn't been fully factored in? I think it can sit there on the bottom, just sort of hanging out. For US companies, not for Chinese companies listed in China. Because right. arguably, we've seen that priced into Chinese equities. They've had a dreadful time until recently. They've had a really tough time. Does it go the other way? That's, this is something yeah. that I struggled with for years. I thought for a long, long time that the Chinese consumer would just tolerate what was happening and would carry on buying Western companies. They'd want your Ralphie MHs. They'd want your foreign autos. I'm just wondering whether we're really seeing in the last couple of years something much, much bigger. And if we do get a President Donald Trump and he goes even harder on tariffs, it's the tit for tat, not from the government, from the consumer that is far more interesting. Especially considering the fact that the more there is sort of rhetoric around this, the more you see Chinese consumers actually voting with their feet, voting with their pocketbooks. But you get all of the different factors. AMD not being able to sell certain chips in China, while you do have a sort of nationalist feeling among the Chinese consumer, is this priced in? at a time when basically the U.S. is being treated as a bastion of exceptionalism, as you were just talking about. It's tough to be a multinational in this world right now. Do you know what was really revealing? BNP Paribas, the way they responded to that growth target in China, they viewed the target as a tool to boost confidence domestically, to tell the consumer, to tell the people of China that this was the growth target we were shooting for, this lofty goal, and that in and of itself was going to help us hit it because that would boost confidence. OK, this is sort of like, you know, if youth unemployment is too low, just don't report it. If you don't really have a message that you want to tell, don't give a press conference. Does that work? I don't know. Let's check back in six months. Yeah, I'm not sure that's going to boost animal spirits in any way, shape or form, but we shall see. Equities right now on the S&P 500, negative by a third of 1% on the S&P and the bond market shaping up as follows. Yields have been lower throughout much of this morning. We're down this morning by another three basis points to 417.79. In foreign exchange, the euro 108. 
49. Coming up this hour, JP Morgan's Elise Ossenba on growth expectations beyond the MAG7. Stone Court Capital's Rick Davis on Nikki Haley's future as voters head to the polls for Super Tuesday. And Lauren Goodwin of New York Life Investments looking ahead to the payrolls report on Friday. We begin with our top story, the performance of Tesla and Apple casting a shadow over a stock market sitting close to all-time highs. JP Morgan's Elise Ossenba saying this, the economic backdrop remains healthy, supporting a case for patience. And earnings keep surprising to the upside. We think most of the MAG7 will continue to deliver strong growth, but we're looking for the growth to broaden out. Elise, I'm pleased to say it's with us here in New York. Elise, good morning to you. Good morning. I went back over your old calls at the end of last year. They've held up really quite well. Can you go through them and just walk us through what you were looking for and why ultimately you've been right? Sure. So I think we started embracing the optimism at the right time. What we began to realize about six months ago is that the U.S. economy is much more resilient to higher interest rates than we initially thought maybe at the onset of 2023. And now we're at this stage where potential growth is starting to inflect higher, largely underpinned by labor market dynamics. You've seen that supply side of the labor market improve, really driven by things like uh, foreign born workers and also women's labor force participation. And so all of the ingredients are kind of there for a sustained, um, a sustained expansion of the U.S. economy. And that is what underpins our conviction in earnings growth. For and it wasn't rate cuts. That's what's interesting about this. So it's going back over an old note of yours that you were waiting for a further loosening in the labor market before being fully confident of imminent rate cuts. That wasn't the position of a lot of people coming into 2024. Are you seeing any sign whatsoever that we're seeing deterioration in the labor market? Not yet. I mean, we just had that January payrolls report that came in really hot. We'll see what Friday, you know, ends up having in store for us. But again, it's that supply side of the equation that I think is really helping ease some of that tightness in the labor market. And we did just shift our rate cut expectations. We came into this year calling for five. Now we're right about three. Um, but that doesn't derail this optimistic equity outlook that we have because it's really the earnings that we expect to do the heavy lifting. And we think the multiple can stay, you know, right around where it is by year end. So far, the earnings really have been consolidated in the Magnificent Seven, or I guess now we can call them the Magnificent Six or Five. Yeah. And I'm wondering, you know, where you see this broadening out to come from since some of the smaller companies that are more consumer facing are arguably also the more interest rate sensitive ones that will struggle more if rates are held higher for longer. Absolutely. We are not saying that dispersion in the market's going to go away. You know, to your point, the Magnificent Seven did the bulk of the heavy lifting to eke out that positive gain in S&P 500 earnings growth for full year 2023. But going forward, we think the remaining 493 names in the index can ultimately muster about 8% earnings growth this year. And we're focused on themes like AI, hype there is very real, industrials, given the policy tailwinds, and also, you know, healthcare innovation and different dynamics that we're seeing amongst the consumer cohort. So I want to ask you my worry, my worry of the day, which is how much are we underpricing the risk of the China aspect, the China factor to some of the tech companies in the U.S. that do have Chinese businesses, that do have to, uh, you know, deal with their footprint currently, or is this just an Apple and Tesla story? You know, it might be a company specific story. And I think markets are really level headed in how we're digesting this. You're seeing that price action. Even within the Magnificent Seven, there is this dispersion. But other companies like Microsoft, AMD, um, NVIDIA, et cetera, you know, their earning stories are really underpinned by real results. Some of that's being driven domestically, but this is also really a global phenomenon um, that we don't expect to go away. You mentioned some of the other 493 stocks and the AI hype being real. Is it AI hype or is it AI, AI reality? Does it matter? Or is it just basically if they put AI in their earnings report, you're in? I, listen, I, I think it matters a lot because we learned some hard lessons about things like the hype around electric vehicles, you know, the, the metaverse, et cetera. Um, and I shouldn't have used hype because we are seeing it translate to real earnings results. You think back to what Microsoft released at the end of the fourth quarter, just as an illustrative example, their contribution to their cloud services growth um, coming from AI doubled from the previous quarter. So this is happening. It's happening fast. And soon we would expect the impact to expand beyond just those enablers and direct beneficiaries because we expect it to be a tailwind across a lot of different sectors. You know, I used to have a daily segment. It was 30 minutes after the opening bound. Bramo would come on every single day with me on Bloomberg TV, and it was basically Bramo's worry. We'd literally <laughs> finished the program. It didn't matter where the market was. Lisa would just talk about what she's worried about for the next three minutes or so. That. That was, that was, that was a good fun. segment, that was wasn't great. it? Yeah, yeah, I would come on and just say I say this because the producer's wondering whether we should sort of bring back 
Ramo's worry of the day. Pick target bonds. Like, I think that should be like the final, <laughs> final, final thoughts, final yeah, segment well, every single day. At least you're going to stick with us, I'm pleased to say. At least Austin Burr of JP Morgan. Let's get you an update on Stories Elsewhere this morning. We can do that with your Bloomberg brief. Let's cross over to Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. It's the biggest day on the presidential primary calendar. Voters in 16 states and one territory head to the polls for Super Tuesday. Former President Donald Trump is expected to win a majority of the Republican delegates that are up for grabs tonight. He picked up 29 last night in North Dakota, sweeping the caucuses with 84 percent versus Nikki Haley's 14 percent. Activist investor Nelson Peltz wants to, quote, restore the magic at Disney. His try and fund management published in a 133 page white paper ahead of the company's AGM. It suggests a partner for Disney traditional TV channels, a review of the studio operations, and a succession plan for CEO Bob Iger. A group formed by Trion holds about $3.5 billion in Disney stock and is seeking an overhaul of the board. Target, up in the pre-market. Fourth quarter earnings beat estimates with better inventory management. Target has faced headwinds with shoppers buying fewer discretionary items thanks to higher inflation and interest rates. It's also launching a membership program to rival Amazon Prime and Walmart Plus. That's your Bloomberg Brief, John. Hey, Danny, thank you. The stock is up by something like 8%. They do not have the inventory issues they had coming out of the pandemic. Inventory down by about 12% in the fourth quarter. Can we just take a second to realize how difficult it was to be a buyer during the pandemic. Oh, I know. I mean, if you think about the changing appetite, suddenly everyone wanted stretch pants and then people wanted to work out, you know, to, to actually go back to work. They bought it all. It took yeah. months to arrive. It I arrived know. and no one wanted it anymore. I mean, it's just, oh, I, I feel for them. Uh, tremendously difficult. That stock is positive in the pre-market. Up next on this program, decision day for Nikki Haley. We're going to do as much as we can. I want to be as competitive as we can, as long as we're competitive. Look, 70 percent of Americans say they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden. That's not a small number. And that decision, should she stay or should she go? That conversation up next. Equities down here by a third of 1% on the S&P 500. The bond market's shaping up as follows. We're down four basis points now on a 10-year. 416. Forgive the surprise as I give you the update on the bond market. Down two basis points on a two-year. <laughs> Been a quiet morning in the bond market, OK? Down two basis points on a two-year. 458 on that two-year yield. The big one next stop for this market is the economic data later this morning. 10 a.m. Eastern time. The ISM Services Index. Then tomorrow, ADP. Jolts. Claims on Thursday. Then the big one Friday. The payrolls report just around the corner. Under surveillance this morning, it's decision day for Nikki Haley. The voters can take the person out of the race very quickly, but a court shouldn't be doing that, and the Supreme Court saw that very well. And I really do believe that will be a unifying factor. We're going to do as much as we can. I want to be as competitive as we can. We certainly have numbers that we're hoping for, but we'll see what happens tomorrow, as long as we're competitive. Look, 70 percent of Americans say they don't want Donald Trump or Joe Biden. That's not a small number. Here's the latest. Nikki Haley making good on her promise to stay through Super Tuesday, despite polls suggesting voters will solidify a November rematch between Donald Trump and President Joe Biden. Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital joins us now for more. Rick, do we understand, do we know what the threshold is for Nikki Haley to stay in this race beyond tomorrow? Yeah, I think she's got to be able to show people that she still has some level of competitiveness. I mean, like her her low points have been the 20 percent that she's gotten in like Iowa and her high points are 40 percent that she got in in uh, New Hampshire. So uh, can she stay in that trading range enough to collect up enough delegates? I mean, her biggest hurdle is that half of these are winner take all states. So for over 400 of these delegates out of the 865 that are going to be picked are going to go to Trump because he can win the winner take all states. And then the rest are basically up for grabs. And, you know, we'll see how many she can collect. We have a lot more closed primaries than we've had. What can they tell us about potentially Trump's and her and her when it comes to her staying in the race? Because a closed primary means if you're a Democrat or independent, you can't get involved in a Republican primary. Yeah, that's right. She has benefited from the open primaries that have been going on so far. That's how she's accumulated the kind of percentages that she's gotten uh, because she has a lot of uh, crossover appeal, moderate Republicans, 
uh, Republicans who conservative Republicans who don't like Trump. That'll be how she has to feed off of this. And and there are current polls. Uh, uh, Florida Atlantic came out with one today indicating that about a third of the Republican Party uh, doesn't like Trump, doesn't want to vote for Trump, doesn't want Trump on the ballot in the general election. Uh, and so that's got to be where she uh, gets the accumulation of, of ballots, accumulation of votes, accumulation of delegates. The question is, can she turn them out? She doesn't have an infrastructure. Uh, she does have money. And the question is, is the case that she can be making tonight after all this is said and done to donors is that, please give me more money to keep my campaign going? Because if the money dries up, there's really no there there for her. Well, when you look at today's primary for both Republicans and Democrats, it's basically over. This is what Libby Cantrell Pimko says. But then she goes on to say, and no, between now and then, we do not expect some other candidate air dropping in to replace Biden or Trump as the party nominee. Rick, a lot of people continuously are almost hopeful that the Republicans or Democrats would put forward someone else. Do you ever see a position in this election that we could see Biden or Trump dropping out? You know, it's a, a weird phenomenon. They call them the double haters, people who hate both candidates. Seventy percent of the country's voters want a different set of candidates, both of them. And so these double haters are not going to get any joy. Uh, neither candidate is going to drop out. Uh, and the only thing that could cause either one of these individuals to not be on the ballot in November is a health concern. Uh, obviously, with two guys, you know, in, in the age group that they're in, a health concern has to be uh, something that you pay attention to. But outside of that, there's no political rationale for the parties dumping either one of these guys. So this is the this is the pot that you're going to see. Uh, this is what you're going to be able to choose for. And frankly. I think it's been a big problem for Joe Biden because uh, the idea that someone else is going to fill his shoes and be more attractive in the general election has really kept a lot of his enthusiasm down. Uh, that's a campaign that desperately needs to prove they're the candidate, they're going to be on the ballot, and they need to start generating some enthusiasm around that. So, Rick, this is the pot that we've got. But do we understand this pot? I mean, this is sort of my question heading into an actual season where maybe we're going to hear about policy. Hopefully we hear something about what's going to happen with respect to tariffs, what's going to happen with respect to uh, deficit reduction or lack thereof. I mean, are we facing something that could be, and I keep going back to this, a Liz Truss moment for the United States if a series of different uh, policy measures are rolled out at a time where the U.S. is facing a resurgence in growth, but also inflation? Well, I think we're going to get a really clear indication of that on Thursday night during the State of the Union. Does, does, does the president put out an agenda for the future? What is his claim to a second term? What's he going to do? Uh, it's totally unclear. Most of it has been rear guard action, fighting over immigration, trying to demonstrate success on the economy. But we've heard very little from Joe Biden on what is the plan for the next four years? If, if he wants another term, what's he going to do with it? I don't think you can expect any of that from Donald Trump. Donald Trump is Donald Trump. He's saying exactly the same thing on the stump today that he said in 2016 and 2020. So none of that is likely to change. I don't think you're going to see a lot of new policy prescriptions uh, out of the Republican side of this equation. But I do think the onus is on the president. He's he's the governing uh, uh, leader of the country. Uh, what is what is it that he's going to offer to voters in the general election that's different than what he's doing today? Because what he's doing today is not going to get him a victory in November. Well, Rick, that means a complete strange change in strategy, because at the moment his whole pitch is I'm not him. And that was the pitch last time around. Are you saying that's not going to work this time? Well, look at the Bloomberg surveys of swing states. I mean, he's losing every single one of them. The pitch is not working. And so if he does not find some space where he can communicate a new policy toward immigration, now rising up to, in many states, the number one issue. Uh, it's overcome the economy because, frankly, voters are starting to get more comfortable with the economy. They, they actually are going to reward Biden with some support on the economy for a change. And so uh, he's got to be able to address the concerns that the country has. And one of those, for instance, is immigration. He goes down the border last week, same day as Trump. Trump just lambasts him about his management of the border. And, and Biden shows no effort to try and give us a new prescription for his administration on the border. He is, in our last survey, 
uh, uh, only getting a 25 percent approval rating on the border. I mean, it's absolutely the worst issue for him in the country. And, and people are galvanized by the headlines about, you know, the massive amount of people coming across the border and, and, and making their ways to cities all across the country and creating a lot of pressure. And, and Rick, he's got to release some of that pressure. We've got to go. It's good to catch up with you, though, sir. Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital. We've got to go because it's that time of the hour where I turn to a market guest and say, forgive me, we're going to talk about politics. At least forgive me. We're going to talk about politics. <laughs> How much thought are you giving this right now? Can you avoid it, at least for the next few months? Oh, we cannot avoid it. It's coming up in every meeting. I think the welcome thing for a lot of people, though, is at the very least, we know what we're getting with both. Right. We're in the midst of a Biden administration with Trump. We already had four years of that. So there's perhaps a little less uncertainty associated with this election. But nonetheless, you know, the the nerves are are still there. You say we know what we're getting with both. But you will remember that night in November 2016 where equity markets sold off aggressively. Then they got bought back. We all remember the acceptance speech. He starts talking about infrastructure and everyone's like, oh, OK, let's focus on the policy. We might get some tax cuts. This might be good. We start talking about the Trump trade a few years down the line. We start talking about tariffs. How different will it be? I just wonder whether it is going to be the same this well, time around. To Rick's point before, I think Trump is still Trump. He's talking about tariffs. He's talking about things like deregulation. He wants to make those provisions of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent. Um, and so that's helping us a little bit kind of lay out a scenario analysis and broad brushstrokes. This might end up looking like something if Trump does win, you know, potential dollar strength and a little bit of upside for yields. If people get, you know, more concerned about things like the deficit, it could be good for small and mid cap equities that are more domestically focused. Um, but I think Either way, what we're encouraging investors to focus on is what they can control. So let's think through how to make your portfolio more tax efficient. Let's talk about bigger picture global themes that are probably going to play out regardless, like security, for example. Well, when you talk about yields being a little bit higher, I mean, that's sort of what I was referring to with the Liz Trust moment. When do you sort of jump the shark in terms of uh, talking about protectionist policies at the same time of potentially slowing growth and inflation that still is a problem? At what point do higher yields really derail some of your investment thesis? Or is there sort of like a line in the sand that really becomes concerning? If we're using the 10 year kind of as our reference point, I think four and a half percent is where we once again start to pound the table on duration because we think that's probably the sustainable ceiling. Maybe you see, you know, a tick up higher, closer to those 5% levels that we had in the fall. Um, but four and a half percent is what gets us excited about seeing a little more value in terms of interest rates, because ultimately over the long term, we do still think it's going to be Fed policy that's going to drive that longer term yield level. I'm going to have you make this a think. All right. We're going to talk about this every day for the next few days. I'm going to, I mean, I'm going to, and everyone's going to just completely ignore I'm me. I'm so on board They're with going you. to Don't say, worry. you know, Liz Truss is not relevant to the U.S. political backdrop. And that's going to be a key question, is it? I'll go back to the same question I always ask. Does Washington retain the privilege of acting recklessly with the nation's debt? And yes or no? You and I will be the only people talking about it because everybody else just says, you know what, it's Fed policy. They've always operated like this. But we'll keep trying. Elise enjoyed it. It's good to see you. Elise Austin for there. Yeah of JP Morgan. Let's turn to the equity market. This is where equity futures are right now on the S&P 500. Then I'll tell you what's coming up next. Equity futures on the S&P right now, negative by a third of 1%. We are lower on yield on a 10-year, down by five basis points at 4.16. Sneak peek at a two-year, we're down two basis points. Your two-year yield this morning, 4.58. Coming up next on the program, Lauren Goodwin of New York Life Investments weighing in on what investors will be watching as Super Tuesday results come in. Lauren Goodwin on the politics and what it means for financial markets, which sets us up for the perfect question, really, the prospect of a Liz Trust <laughs> moment in America. Do you like that? Yes, Does that, that was so okay. good. I knew Let it was coming. Again. It was so good. Let me do that again. We'll do that. <laughs> which sets us up for the perfect moment, really, the prospect for a Liz Trust moment in America. That's next on the program Absolutely. from New York. This is Bloomberg. Stocks on the S&P 500 negative here by 0.4 percent. On the Nasdaq, we're down by about 0.6. Real reasons for that underperformance. Tesla and Apple, two pieces of that puzzle. In the bond market, a two-year, 10-year, 30-year with a yield that looks like this. A two-year yield down by two basis points, the 458. 4.15.84 on a 10-year, we're down five basis points. Lisa Gunn is that economic data 
90 minutes away. Yeah, assessing after uh, we got a little bit of a sell-off, but then people saying that maybe a constant hunter's view of things is correct, that the disinflation does continue. Ultimately, and you've asked this question before, how many hot prints does it take for people to believe that maybe this inflation is not fading as quickly as some had hoped? If February confirms January, we go another step in that direction, that's for sure. I'll keep going back to that line from Kit Jukes of Sokjan. We are feeding on a diet rich in U.S. exceptionalism. The dollar's feeding on that. Euro dollar right now, 108.46. Dollar a little stronger. Euro a touch weaker on that currency pair, negative by something like a tenth of 1%. want to get to those two stories for you. Apple and Tesla under pressure in China. Data from CounterPoint Research showing iPhone sales in China slumping 24% in the first six weeks of the year. The slowdown coming even after Apple introduced rare discounts to stimulate demand. And Tesla is set to extend losses after data from China's Passenger Car Association showed shipments plunged in February. The EV maker shipped just over 60,000 vehicles from the factory in Shanghai. That's down about 16% from the previous month. AMH, we're trying to work out what is going on in China. Well, is it a growth issue? And it's funny because we obviously have the growth targets for China today. And even they're saying this can be difficult to reach, quite ambitious, is 5%. Um, Tesla and Apple both cutting their product price points, but they're still struggling to remain competitive. And everyone is talking about two things. One, growth, on the other hand, is part of this patriotic buying from Chinese consumers who are shunning American products and saying, well, we have a Huawei phone we can buy for cheaper just as good as Apple, and it's Chinese. That last point is really important. The fact of the matter is, is that Apple dropped prices and the competitors still took market share. That's a big problem in your second biggest market. Can they address it, given the fact that it's not just the end consumer, but it's also the production of it? There are a lot of questions for Apple to answer. My question is, is this just an Apple and Tesla story or is this a broader issue? Pretty much everyone who I ask says, it's just an Apple and Tesla story. So I'm going to keep asking and everyone's going to keep <laughs> saying that, sort of like the Liz Trust movement when everyone's saying, you know, ultimately the U.S. exceptional exceptionalism will roll out. Stay tuned. We're going to return to the Liz Trust question in a moment. <laughs> Apple's down about 2% in everyone the free market. can't wait. What a turn to the nuances of this story. Israeli war cabinet member Benny Gantz meeting with top officials in D.C., including Vice President Kamala Harris. Harris pressing Gantz for a pause in fighting and a deal to free hostages, but praising what she called Israel's, quote, constructive approach to seeking a six-week ceasefire. The Biden administration continuing to push Israel on getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Punchbowl News reporting the Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is set to meet with Gantz today. Now, Amory, you can frame for us the distance between Gantz and Netanyahu in this visit. Well, this is huge because also Punchbowl News is reporting that Speaker Johnson is not going to meet Benny Gantz. And the issue that is going on in Israel is uh, between Netanyahu and Gantz. Gantz is more of a centrist. Many analysts say if a, a Israeli election was held today, he'd be the one to win, which is why Netanyahu apparently had a very frank conversation with him before he flew to the United States saying, remember, there's one prime minister of Israel, and that is me. And that's potentially why you see Speaker Johnson wanting to put some distance and not wanting to take this meeting with him. How much of what happens today spills over into the address from the president Thursday evening? Well, I think what Kamala Harris said the other day over the weekend, speaking in Alabama, talking about immediate ceasefire, talking about the dire conditions of Palestinians, I think you're going to see a read through to the president's speech on Thursday. NBC is reporting that actually she was going to be a lot tougher and they watered down her speech. So potentially you're going to see the president ramp it up and his pressure on Israel. That's policy. Let's talk politics. Voters heading to the polls in 15 states for Super Tuesday. But compared to other years, the excitement is all but gone. Donald Trump is practically guaranteed to clinch a victory over the last remaining GOP rival, Nikki Haley, effectively ending her presidential bid. This is President Biden faces no serious challenge of his own, but Democrats will be closely watching so-called uncommitted protest votes over his handling of the war we just discussed. So talk me through, say, Michigan, what that looked like there and what you expect this to look like tonight. Well, for Michigan, the big question there was, of course, for Biden. This is a swing state. You saw over 100,000 individuals come out and vote uncommitted. Now, these are people who likely voted for Biden in 2020, and this was a protest vote. So I think what Biden is struggling with is shoring up those individuals that voted for him in 2020, some of them a part of his base. Trump has the base, which we continuously to see in these primary states. The issue he has is winning over the Nikki Haley electorate those Republicans who are more moderate or those potential Democrats who don't want to see another four years of Biden, who would have maybe voted for Nikki Haley. That's the issue Trump's going to have when it comes to the electorate expanding that base. Here's the view on Wall Street 
on that issue. Lauren Goodwin in New York, Life Investments, saying that no matter the outcome of the Super Tuesday contest, markets will be watching four areas of policy, including how much money the government spends, where the government spends that money, foreign policy and migration. Lauren, I think you know where this conversation is going to go. So good morning to you and we'll get straight to it. How are you doing? <laughs> Let's talk about it. The Liz Trust moment. Do we face the prospect of one later this year in America? I don't think we've faced the prospect of one later this year, but the question is so important because what we've seen from both of these administrations is that they are very willing to spend. And what they spend on, of course, is different. That has sectoral impacts for investors. But the reality that the deficit is likely to continue to be, in a long-term sense, unsustainable is really important. It's one of the reasons why we expect long-term interest rates to be volatile and that to be an important part of portfolio construction ahead. So people could have said that the deficit was important a year ago. Why is it suddenly going to come into the fore in a more significant way, given the fact that everyone's been saying, oh, it's going to matter, it's going to matter, and then it just hasn't mattered, auction after auction, no matter how much we talk about it. The, the tricky thing about debt sustainability is that it's death by a thousand cuts. You can make mistakes over and over and over again, and it's not clear whether it's the 17th or 25th mistake that results in your Liz Trust moment. Uh, but that is something that as the, not only the level of debt, the flow of debt, but also the cost of debt in the U.S. economy becomes more important. So again, in the near term, when we think about portfolio construction, that's about rate volatility as opposed to necessarily an upheaval of the U.S. debt markets, which are so much deeper and well capitalized relative to even the U.K., which is, of course, an already well capitalized economy. But it remains an area where as governments continue to show profligacy, we should expect at least the conversation among investors to continue. When you talk about portfolio construction and higher yields as a result of some of these debt concerns, which people, a number of different investors are talking about, at what point do those higher yields become punitive for asset prices in a way that is underappreciated? I agree with what Elise said earlier, which is that three and a half to four and a half percent range on the 10 year right now is very reasonable. Let's first note that that's a wide range of reasonable outcomes for the 10 year relative to history. So again, speaking to the volatility, I think 5% is where we really start to see significant pain and likely a credit event in the US economy. Now, we're nowhere near that right now. Um, but to be honest with you, duration and interest rate volatility in, in a one direction or another isn't our favorite place to take risks. So while we expect the Fed's next move to be a cut, and we've been moving into short duration credit to lock in higher yields, we've been balancing it with long duration municipal bonds as a way to sort of draw that equivalency and, and make a more neutral duration play. And this conversation started with how much they'll spend. Can we turn to where they'll spend it, the sector plays. What are the sector plays right now for you? Where are they going to spend that money? There's, honestly, compared to what you would call a stereotypical Democratic versus um, Republican platform, not as much difference potentially than in, in past elections. One area where we see both uh, administrations having already spent and expect them continue to spend is in brown energy. It's one of the areas of policy that there's so much investment in the, the Democratic administration towards infrastructure, which we expect to be would be sustained, that brown energy doesn't leave the, the playbook entirely. Where do you see them the most far apart? A um, couple of areas. I think the, the extent of, of green energy and infrastructure investing, I think, is incredibly important. And that's a global theme. That's something that is important, not only in the global equity, but also global bond markets. Another area where we see pretty major differences is in, um, is in migration, immigration. And when it comes to defense of border, um, border policy spending there compared to the, um, the, the more um, traditionally balanced focus focused on education, educated um, immigrants. These are areas that where we see just big differences and not just approach, but also the root of the policy themselves. If they're getting at big, big differences when it looks at migration, how is that going to spill over to the economy? Because it could be very different in terms of the labor market. That's right. So widespread uh, increases in immigration over the past couple of years have played a role in the health of the labor market as we've seen it so far. And here I'm speaking strictly on economic terms as opposed to political terms. Um, we looked at what would the exact opposite situation look like? Let's say you had mass deportation of undocumented workers in the US. We actually have some good historical examples in individual states of what those policies look like. And um, by the mass 
math from our research, you would see a 5.7% decrease in GDP growth if such a, a policy were to take place. Now, that's an extreme policy. I think it's very difficult to carry out. It's nowhere near our base case. But that's the type of, of difference you're seeing in terms of labor market knock-on effects. I can spot one thing where there's not much daylight, and that's international trade and national security becoming one single issue for this administration and a previous one as well. How are you thinking about trade in the years to come? This is one of the areas where I think the approach towards policy is quite different, but the policies themselves have shown not to be very different at all. Um, the reality is, is that for the competitiveness of the global economy moving forward, you have to be involved in energy and in semiconductor um, production. There's been so much focus on bringing semiconductor production back to the U.S. that is not distinct between the two presidents. Again, the approach and the, the language around those changes are different. Um, and if in, in specifically with respect to trade, I would expect to see uh, a more likely uptick in tariffs in a Republican presidency as opposed to a Democratic presidency. But we haven't seen tariffs rolled back in this Democratic presidency. So the core of the policy, the idea that the U.S. or U.S. allies need to be an important part of semiconductor production ahead, very, very complicated supply chain, that's, in, that's impacted not only the political environment, but also investment. We haven't seen deglobalization. It's a re-globalization with lots of money being spent to make this happen. How much have we accurately priced the ramifications from that in, say, some of the big tech players? And I say this today with Apple and Tesla both seeing the effects of potentially both the slowdown in the Chinese consumer as well as the geopolitical risks. How much is that a headwind in a way that isn't really being talked about enough? The reality for the Magnificent Seven that have been so central to semiconductor production and use in the US and really the global economy so far, that enthusiasm we believe is correct. The challenge is that it's seven companies. And so there are going to be idiosyncrasies in their demand, in their supply chains that are likely to cause tumult, and we're seeing it today. And I think it's important to note that in the dot-com bubble, what cracked the whole system wasn't somebody you know, really failing to present earnings. It was Cisco having about 50% projected growth instead of the expected 60% percent projected growth. So we can still have incredibly strong profitable companies and see valuations move lower. The way that we balance that from a portfolio construction perspective is to acknowledge that these companies are um, they're showing strong profitability, good quality, but they're not diversified. So adding an application layer of small and mid-cap growth companies, as well as a digital infrastructure layer, we think makes a, a nicer package to stave off some of those idiosyncratic impacts. Plenty of companies didn't present earnings in that time. And as you know, stocks carried on going high. That was distinct about that time. Look, is this about sectors, tech, which you're talking about, or size? Is it small versus large? Because large multinationals are just going to have such a difficult time with the policy changes that we're starting to see. But what we heard from Pierre Farragou was that in a number of the big tech names, people are pricing in no upside from China. That's not the same for Apple and Tesla that are much more intricately connected to them. So it raises this question of, is it just sort of the known knowns, right? That people are sort of pricing this in or could you get some sort of black swan event, and it sounds like nobody is saying that there could be a black swan event. Someone will come on soon, Bramo, I promise. <laughs> there could always be a black swan event. Thank you That's for that. the nature yeah, of black swan events. That's good. Trying to keep her happy, Lauren, all right? <laughs> Lauren Goodwin in New York, Life Investments. Thank you very much. Let's get you an update on stories elsewhere this morning. Here's your Bloomberg Brief with Danny Berger. Hey, Danny. Hey, John. Americans are now paying, paying nearly as much interest on other debt as they are on their mortgages. New data from the Bureau of Economic Analysis says interest paid on everything from credit cards to student loans has hit an annual rate of $573 billion for January. That's the highest on record. Americans are currently paying $578 billion in annual mortgage interest. NYCB higher in the pre-market by about 1% after it plunged and had more downgrades yesterday. Shares of the company dropped to a 96 low, falling 43% in two days. Fitch cut its rating and Moody's lowered theirs again after already rating the bank at junk. NYCB has lost more than two-thirds of its value this year. Counterpoint Research says iPhone sales in China fell 24% over the first six weeks of this year. 
To stimulate demand, Apple offered a rare discount on its site in stores in January. Apple fell below a 16% market share from 19% a year ago, according to the researchers. Apple shares have fallen 9% since the start of the year to lose the title of the world's most valuable company to Microsoft. And that's your Bloomberg Brief. John. Danny, thank you. That stock is down by 2%. Is that enough Liz Trust today? Uh, We're done no. for today? I'm not, yeah, I'm done. Okay, cool. Up next on the program, Tesla hitting the brakes. I think Tesla is more or less finding a floor in, uh, uh, in China and in a place where they can maintain the kind of volumes they've been setting in the country um, in, uh, in recent months. That conversation coming up next. We're 45 minutes out from the open and bell. Equity futures on the S&P 500. Near session low is negative 0.4% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City, cash open just around the corner, 42 minutes away. Equity futures on the S&P 500, lower all morning, negative by 0.4%, near session lows right now. Bid in the bond market, yields are lower by six basis points now. Session lows on the yield on a 10-year, 4.15.45. Under surveillance this morning, Tesla hitting the brakes. All EV makers have had to lower their prices a lot in order to maintain Demand, we've seen a game of market share moving back and forth between BYD and Tesla. I think Tesla is more or less finding a floor in, uh, uh, in China and in a place where they can maintain the kind of volumes they've been setting in the country um, in, uh, in recent months. Here's the latest today. Tesla falling after its China shipments plunged to the lowest level in over a year, according to prelim data from China's Passenger Car Association. Shipments for the EV maker's Shanghai factory falling 19% year over year. The stock is down nearly 25% year to date. RBC's Tom Narayan saying this. Tesla has in the past indicated plans to eventually reach 20 million vehicle sales per year. While we can envision a scenario where it becomes a major player in the US on a unit sales basis, we do wonder if national champions in Western Europe and China limit Tesla's ability to gain similar market share levels. Tom, I'm pleased to say, is with us around the table. Tom, great to have you with us. Let's just start with the news out of China. How very real is the slowdown in the Chinese market? I think you also have to take it with a little pinch of salt. Remember, there's some tough comps here with the China New Year that happened in February. I mean, BYD went from 200,000 units to 120,000 units. So it's the entire market that happened. That's not to say that this that, that growth isn't slowing. We knew that. Elon was talking about it on the earnings call. But we're in a lull period between the Model 3, Model Y, and then the upcoming affordable car to come in 2026. Remember, this is a very long-term story when you think about Tesla. Right. So you have to look at it from that lens. Certainly there's a slowdown happening, but I don't think it's something that folks should be overly worried about. I'm happy to have the long term conversation. There was a phrase you used and it was national champions. I just wonder, is that what we're going to end up in in the world of EVs? We're going to have a national champion in China, a national champion across Europe and a national champion here in America. Is that the direction of travel? I mean, that's always how it's been, right? No automaker in the history of autos has ever gained more than 10% market share. There's a reason for that, right? It's geopolitics. And, you know, for that reason, we actually only see Tesla gaining maybe five to five and a half million cars sold a year at peak, at maturity. Um, for it to gobble up 20 million cars a year, what happens to GM? What happens to Ford? What happens to Renault? What happens to Stellantis? What hap I mean, you could see governments will step in and probably not allow that to happen. There's a real issue here, though, and, and Tesla might have a long term good story with respect to being a dominant auto manufacturer, but maybe not as much on the valuation side when it turns out it's a car company. It is not a tech company in a, in a sort of an exclusive way, the way that some people would like it to be. Does its valuation have to reset as a result of dealing with these sort of uh, national champions and geopolitical tensions and some of the you know, ebbs and flows of just the natural demand for these vehicles? I think if you think this is a car company, you should stay away from this stock. My valuation <laughs> for being a car company is only about $80 billion. And my price target assumes a $1 trillion valuation. So most of my valuation is actually on non-car things. It's autonomy, robo-taxi, FSD, and Megapack. This is battery storage, which is a tremendous opportunity. So I think you have to look at this company beyond being a car business. No car company has ever been worth more than max 100 to $200 billion anyway. 
So you really, unfortunately, have to look at this company from a lens outside of being a car company. How many of those other subsets, the autonomy, the robo-taxis, are hinging on anywhere other than the United States? I mean, are these really U.S.-focused efforts at a time where people are looking for that kind of isolation from the geopolitical tensions? That's a great question. For me, my evaluation is predominantly on the U.S. for these things. A lot of people don't realize the robo-taxi market, you know, auto market's about a $3 trillion market. That's like the box on wheels. If you add robo-taxis, autonomy, that takes share from planes, trains, it's a living room with wheels, it's a bedroom with wheels, it's an office with wheels, the TAM could explode to four or five trillion dollars. Okay, hold on. Okay, back up for one second. Okay, a living room on wheels, it takes away from trains, planes, and automobiles. Okay, at a certain point, isn't it sort of the top is in if Apple's like, I'm out, this isn't really going to happen? I mean, doesn't that sort of send a signal that this has sort of gotten over its skis? I don't think so. I think autonomy, specifically robo-taxis, could be the most significant thing to happen in our lives, honestly. Uh, it's going to save spaces in our cities. How many of us know somebody who's died or been impacted in a car crash? It eliminates that almost entirely. Legislators will regulate this. Um, their FSD product, which is already on the road today, is tremendous. And we're going to get the version 12 that's going to come out this year that's going to solve a lot of the problems that it faces. So even though autonomy is a long-term thing, we have steps that we're going to get to to get us to where we think they're going to get. Before going to flying living rooms, I want to go back to the nationalism. In China, they control everything from the raw materials to processing a battery. At what point, if they're going to really become nationalistic, do they just say, we are no longer exporting these batteries for every other company to make electric cars, you have to buy our car? Yeah, no, I, I don't think they'll do that. I think they're overly dependent. Let's be honest, like Tesla, uh, Chinese exports right now of their EVs, it's like 1-2%. Of, of total uh, auto, you know, autos in the, U the U.S. And, and, and Europe, really. So they really are dependent right now on selling a lot of the ba their battery infrastructure into European OEMs and eventually into U.S. OEMs. They want they want to build factories in Hungary and in Mexico and sell their cars overseas. So they want to sell that stuff. It's the, it's the opposite. It's it's whether or not the U.S. will be an obstruction to their OEMs purchasing those those batteries. Uh, Tom, you said it's something interesting about GM and Ford Stellantis that potentially the U.S. government, you alluded to this, the U.S. government wouldn't let them fail. If this becomes a state-sponsored industry, industry, is the government really going to allow shareholders to take all the upside? How's that going to work if ultimately the U.S. government has to step in? I mean, it's, this, is, this industry is, 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 has a long history of the government stepping in. Tons of it. And supporting this industry. But this feels like a government objective, not for these manufacturers to survive, but the end point. They've set the goal you all need to turn to EV. This is something they're pushing, and that is new. That's a change. That is a change, but we're starting to see some language pull back on that a little bit. Look what happened to the UK, right? Pulling back on the 2030 target, going to 2035. We're hearing about some in the EU talk about, you know, maybe loosening up Euro 7 restrictions. So I actually think governments ultimately, look, what, what is their goal here? Jobs, right? Yeah. So they're gonna wanna protect jobs no matter what. And if it means loosening some of these targets, some of these restrictions, that's probably what they'll do. Got to ask why, though. And isn't that a risk factor that actually the consumer right now is interested in hybrids and not a pure EV play? That's true. Um, we're seeing that predominantly in the U.S., maybe less so in, in Europe. Uh, but I think you have to look at, look, this, what is that, that old saying, you know, progress doesn't move in, in a straight line, but it bends towards justice, right? So if you were to view right, EVs as something in that, you know, that moral compass, you know, we're in a lull period, right? That's what Elon calls it. We're in a period where the early adopters gobbled up their $70,000 Teslas. Now yeah. the mainstream market doesn't really know what an EV is. It's an education process that'll take some time. We also need some EVs that people want, right? There's <laughs> Sweet, enough so of these crossovers. We need some SUVs. We need some pickup trucks. So we'll get there. Battery prices will come down, right? So it just takes some time, but we'll get there. It's almost good to see you. Great to yep. catch up. Thanks for giving us your thoughts. Tom Naran there of RBC. Coming up tomorrow, we'll catch up with Lizanne Saunders of Charles Schwab, Carl Riccadonna of BNP Paribas, Kelsey Barrow of JP Morgan, Kate Moore of BlackRock. A double dose of Chairman Powell on Capitol Hill begins tomorrow, then it's onwards to the payrolls report on Friday. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. This was Bloomberg Surveillance.